In the Clive Barker Podcast, longtime fans Ryan and Jose interview guests, bring you the news, and take deep dives into Barker-related stuff. In episode 464, we chat with Stephen Jones about his time as a publicist for Hellraiser, the A to Z of horror book, Shadows in Eden, Nightbreed and Hellraiser Chronicles, and his upcoming book, Videotapes from Hell. This episode is sponsored by Don Bertram's Celebrate Imagination. Don Bertram is a longtime friend of Clive and advocate of his art, but Don's unique and inspiring paintings are for sale and over 50% of the proceeds go to the Arts and Medicine program at the Texas Children's Cancer Center. There's even a paver in Washington, D.C. representing Celebrate Imagination. We're thrilled that this worthy cause is sponsoring our podcast again this year, and we hope that you'll consider looking over his Pinterest page and commissioning a painting of your own. For commissions, Don requires no money down, and there will be no obligation on your part. You can also head over to the Etsy shop to buy one of his books, like A Chimney Sweep's Tale, Celebrate Imagination, or The Imaginaries. Follow the link in the show notes, or click on the side banner, and let's see what's new with Don Bertram today. Take a look at his new original painting, The Descendant, on his Facebook page, and check out his videos going over the original painting, The Bug Brothers, an intro to the 35th anniversary screening of Hellraiser. Of course, the best way to support this podcast is through our Patreon at patreon.com slash barkercast589. Our subscribers will get exclusive access to content not available anywhere else, like our Collector's Corner video series, Rare Barker videos, and early behind-the-scenes stuff. Plus, backers in the $10 tier will also be able to choose an episode topic. And we might mail you something once in a while, depending on your location. Our supporters also get access to the exclusive channel in our Discord server. We'll be forever grateful if you consider helping us out and subscribing to our Patreon. So what's new on Patreon? Shout out to our... Patreon supporters David Anderson, Eric Vanderholt, Daniel Elvin, Amanda Stewart, and of course our returning sponsor Don Bertram and Celebrate Imagination. Currently available for our Patreon backers, we have a special thank you for being here from Jose that describes the history of the Clive Barker podcast and where we were and what we were doing in the fandom before the podcast started. Uh, we have I put up the, the process of posting an episode so people uh, could see the work that I do, and if they are, you know, aspiring podcasters, maybe all of the missteps that I've made in the past and the sort of honing that I've done ha- might help somebody. Um, so coming soon, we've got the Book Club of Blood that we discussed on previous episodes. Basically, we're going to go through each uh, Books of Blood story and do them like a, a book club, you know, and, and uh, talk about each story as an individual episode. And uh, our, po- our Patreon supporters can join us in those chats. And Jose teases a new post that he's working on, and you'll just have to watch this episode to see what that's going to be. Hi, welcome to episode 464. Uh, today we have another uh, guest with us, and he's been in the horror and uh, literature world for a long time. He's, a, he's been an editor with... I'm not even sure how many books you've edited so far. I've read the last number was 174. So we'll get to that. But right now, <laughs> you've edited uh, Shadows in Eden. You were a unit publicist for uh, a bunch of Hellraisers and Nightbreed. And you were also behind the book for Aether Z of Horror, Hellraiser Chronicles, and Nightbreed Chronicles, among a lot of other things. So we'd like to introduce uh, author and editor Stephen Jones today. Hey, welcome. Hi, guys. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. It's only taken you 464 episodes. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, we should have done this. We should have done this a lot sooner. Well, I'm I'm not getting any younger, so it's glad <laughs> we're doing it now. Trust me. <laughs> All right. So, um, you're still working on on books, and we'll get to that uh, near the end of the episode. You've got another book coming out called Videotapes from Hell with a lot of interesting people there. Yeah. But can you um, tell us a little bit about? What was like, what what was your, uh, what were the initial authors that got you into fiction uh, when you were young? Uh, Okay. I mean, I was born in the 50s, so I'm a baby boomer. Um, I was growing up in the 1960s. I got into comic books, first of all. I was always a DC comics guy, not a Marvel comics guy, although I read Marvel. Um, from there, I got into the monster magazines, uh, Famous Monsters of Filmland, Castle of Frankenstein, things like that. 
because uh, of course I was too young to see horror films, unlike you guys in America, where you, as kids you could go and see horror films a lot of the time. Uh, they were ex certificate over here, so it meant you have to be over sixteen years old. Um, I actually saw my first horror film when I was fourteen years old because I looked older than I was, and right. I've always looked older than I am. Um, but the uh, yeah, so I was I was into yeah. monster mags, I was into comics. And then one day I was coming back from school and I, I went into Woolworths and I was looking through their books and there was a cover of a paperback there, which was very striking. It was in black and white with color lettering, which you didn't really see in those days. And so I picked it up and it was a collection of HP Lovecraft stories. And I read the introduction by August Derleth, who talked about lovecraft and how he knew all these other guys from weird tales magazine robbie howard clark ashton smith and i thought to myself wouldn't it be cool if i could that would be my life i could actually meet writers and artists and just hang out with people and, and do that kind of stuff but you know i didn't know anybody you know, my parents didn't know anybody i was just a kid growing up in london um but uh i kind of read more books read more film stuff and uh started going to conventions and uh the very first uh science fiction convention i went to which was in 1974 wow. um i was introduced to a guy called ramsey campbell and uh ramsey has been my one of my closest friends since then and also my mentor i mean he's one of those guys who's looked after me all through my life and i'm still working with ramsey even today uh, we're doing a he's in a new book of mine coming out next year um, I also met a guy called Dave Sutton at the same convention, and Dave and I ended up editing a whole bunch of anthologies in the 1990s together, and we did a magazine in the 70s called Fantasy Tales, um, which is, has got Barker connections as well, um, if you're not aware, I don't know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, basically, that's how I got into it. And, you know, by going to conventions, you know, you get introduced to somebody else. I got to know Michael Moorcock early on. Then oh, I, started wow. going to the Amer then I started going to the American conventions. And uh, I was befriended by a guy called Carl Edward Wagner, who's no longer with us. But he then started introducing me. Around. And, uh, yeah, so eventually I became immersed in in horror fiction and and so i mean science fiction and fantasy for a while i was never really i mean i like heroic fantasy i like conan and all that kind of stuff solomon kane and elric of Mel melnibony but i was never a big fantasy guy and i was never a big science fiction guy so i just kind of gravitated towards horror i think um it was i i've always said and i i still think it's true is horror is one of those genres that works in any other genre you can have horror romance stories, you can have horror science fiction stories, you can have horror westerns. Um, it is such a broad field. It is so interesting. Um, I think and... that uh, a horror as as a genre has so much scope, right? I mean, when yeah, you compare absolutely. it to other, other genres like romance, yeah. I mean, those romance books are going to be always very, uh, you know, a boy meets girl, girl meets boy. The cover is always kind of the same. Sometimes the guy has a cowboy hat and stuff like that. but. Um, but yeah, I've got a whole bunch of little uh, Solomon Cain, uh, Conan, uh, Bran McMorn. I've always been uh, a big Robert E. Howard collector. And these little paperbacks, sometimes they came with these wonderful little posters and stuff that you could pull out. Oh, yeah. And, uh, illustrations <laughs> they would cool. get from the old magazine. And, and those Solomon Cain books, uh, Ramsey Campbell finished off two of the stories in them. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, wow. To, get into those i haven't uh i'm still collecting i don't have when i moved actually i was going to say um i was not american so i grew up in portugal not too far from from england lovely uh, country I've, I've been to portugal many times wonderful Marcus country huh. i ended up moving to america in 20 uh 2013 but i spent most of my life in portugal and over there it was also hard to get like american comics and stuff like that we only had like two channels uh for most of my life unless you had access to satellite tv but my dad was an immigrant in canada so he would bring me stuff from his travels he flew a lot and um and that's how i got to know uh you know started my first comic books in my collection and stuff like that and uh 
And you were also kind of a big collector, right? You even bagged those comic books and everything back in the. I 60s. have. A, I collect everything. That's the, that's the <laughs> bane of my life. Um, I've still got some of those original comics. I've got all those monster magazines I bought back in the sixties. Um, I mean, you know, when they talk about mint comics, some of mine haven't been out the bags in fifty years. I mean, I read wow. them once, put them away. That so I've got the first four of uh, Marvel's Avengers. I've got the first four Incredible Hulks. I've got Amazing Fantasy 15, the first Spider-Man ever. Oh, my God. I've got wow. Daredevil number one. I've got a whole wow. bunch of stuff out there, guys. Wow. Um, but then I've also got a huge collection of Arkham House books, most of them signed by various people over the years. I've got this one? posters. I've got Lobby. Yeah, I've got that one. Yeah, and it's signed, by, <laughs> it's signed by Frank. Yeah. Um, um, you know, I mean, all wow. these guys I, I got to know at conventions. The problem was I I started getting things signed too late. Mm -hmm. I should have started doing it as soon as I went to conventions. And the problem was these guys were my friends. So I'd be, you know, I'd be standing in the bar having a beer with Carl Lidwood Wagner and Manny Wade Wellman. And Manny was one of those guys who wrote for Weird Tales. And um, did I get him to sign anything back then? Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I did find a weird tales I, I had recently, which I was actually going to upgrade, and I found it was signed by him. And then I realized, yes, I'd bought it at the convention. I'd taken it to the bar with me, and because he was standing there, I just going to sign it. But I've got probably one of the biggest collections of signed weird tales in the world. Um, I've certainly got a fabulous Arkham House collection yeah. um, signed. Um, I've got movie posters, lobby cards, stills, press kits. Um, you can see some behind me, maybe the toys. Uh, the yes. house is filled with toys, mostly yes. Universal Monsters, yeah, the <laughs> classic Universal oh, Monsters wow. uh, toys from the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s. Um, yeah, I collect too damn much. And this is a, not, I don't live in a mansion. I live in a, in a little terrace house in London, in North London. And we've kind of reached maximum input now there's not there's barely an inch anywhere in this house and i'm mm. I'm gonna have to start culling stuff soon i mean i'm getting old anyway and so the time has come to start selling some of the stuff off and just keeping what i really want to keep um, sure i but, mean you know, i've enjoyed it I've, I've 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 enjoyed it for 50 years I've, I've you know i've got original artwork they start me on the original artwork on the walls and uh cover wow. paintings and things like this um there's stuff all over the house and you know occasionally we're through our party here and, and people come in do a barbecue in the garden and they can wander around and, and look at all the crap that's all over the house and uh, <laughs> and, and you get to share it because that's the thing about being a collector you want to share this stuff there's no point hiding it away you want to yeah. share it off to people that's, um, that's the thing that uh, i think we can relate to uh, very deeply because we do a podcast because we want to share our love for clive barker stuff and horror in general and, you know, I, I always have, I also have a bunch of stuff and there's a John Bolton page from Hellraiser. Um, but it's always been like a little bit like you're like a little closet and it's sometimes you open a little drawer, you find a little drawer that's like, oh, this is going to fit here just nicely. And for me, it was really Clive Barker and, and, and all the stuff that he does and the way that he talks uh, and writes and uh, his vision when he makes movies that really got me into it but i would have to say the thing that made me kind of fall in love with clive as a person was this gorgeous book that you made back in the day shadows in eden oh yeah and i don't want to jump the jump the gun here but how did you uh yeah. how did you meet clive get it oh good guy you got the hard cover as well although i actually prefer the cover on the paperback which is even better oh yeah oh, the yeah. Painted one. oh yeah yeah this one that one yeah, yeah i like i really i think they did a really good job on that paperback yeah, yeah. So. it's uh somehow well obviously it's less it's it's uh, less unwieldy than the big paperback but uh for some reason i just i just gravitated to the paperback that was the one i got first and I, then i, I found, actually oh. got one copy of that now because i gave all the others away and it's a tough book to sure. find that paperback you can find the hardcover pretty much on ebay on anywhere else yeah. but the the paperback is a tough one to find especially but the, the uncreased the hardcover oh. came first didn't it oh yeah the hardcover came first yeah we did yeah. that a couple of years yeah. beforehand yeah yeah I, I i bought that when it first came out and for me it was really big because i was just because i i had after watching nightbreed i became obsessed with clive barker and 
So this, you know, coming out just a year later after Nightbreed, I was, um, you know, that this was the perfect timing for me to to learn about Clive Barker, and plus it has this this crazy interior painting, you know, that that's uh, pretty. Oh, the Weeping Papers, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah, the Empires, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's Clive in Eden. That's what it is. Shout out oh, to Clive in Eden. Yeah. yeah, his version of Eden, I suppose. Yeah, his version yeah. of Eden. <laughs> So at the time, were you were you working in uh, TV when you met Clive? Uh, yeah, I started working in TV in the early 1970s. Um, um, I was working for a, a production company in, in London, Soho, which is where, where, where TV and movies tended to congregate. All the, all the film companies were down there. Okay. And I eventually worked my way up to being a, a TV director and producer, doing commercials and documentaries and stuff like that. Um, which was great because I was also at the same time I was a film reviewer, I was publishing magazines, it all kind of blended together, you know what I mean? So it's like, you know, I'd I'd be going to a film preview in the art in the evenings, and then I'd be doing commercials during the day, and then in my spare time I'd be putting magazines together or writing reviews or articles or right. whatever. Um so it yeah it was it was an interesting life and it was an interesting way of, of growing up i mean as i say and then when i wasn't doing all that i was either going to conventions over here or i was going to conventions in america um yeah it was it was it was a great it was a great upbringing for me and uh over the course of that pretty much i got to meet everybody i wanted to meet which was lovely I mean, that's great uh and i understand sometimes meeting uh an author that you appreciate, but not wanting to pull out the book and the pen and be like, Hey, can you sign this for me? Put it yeah. in there. Yes, very much so. Because sometimes yeah. I, I, I don't it. have that anymore. Nowadays, yeah. it's like, just sign this, just sign this <laughs> now. Now I want it signed. And conventions were a lot different, right? I mean, I even like the first one I went to was in like 1990. And even back then, there were, there, you know, it was a uh, comic book convention was really a bunch of mostly comic book sellers, you know, and then there'd be a one or two people signing things and there would weren't any lines well of course that's very different now at comic book conventions where it's yeah. all people signing things right. in huge long lines yeah um now the problem with conventions is they've um over the last 20 years i'm gonna say the whole genre has changed um when i was going to a convention back in the 70s and 80s and 90s mm -hmm. i went to learn i went to meet these people who i grew up yeah. reading books and magazines i wanted to sit in a panel um you know you see, and listen to a bunch of people on a panel uh talking about their careers how they got into things how you get into things how they did stuff you know i get uh, there's the very famous panel um you know with uh, uh clive stephen king peter straub um a whole bunch of other people up on that panel i was there you know when, wow. when stephen king said the future of horror is clive barker i was sitting in the audience wow um, and, you know, that's that? how panels used to be. I mean, it used to be your peers. You know, you looked up to these people. They were, they were, the, they were the amazing writers. Mm. Nowadays, it nobody cares about the old guys. Nobody cares about the the old authors or artists or whatever. All they care about is who the young, new, hot people are, and they're mm. they're now the guests at conventions. And unfortunately, because of this, conventions are dying because these people have got no knowledge to pass on. They've got no history to pass on. Um, they barely know anything themselves. They may have two or three books out, which have been you know, well reviewed in Locus or somewhere. Um, and sometimes these people are not around. I mean, I, I was laughing with a friend the other day. Uh, I was looking back at some old magazines and seeing all these people who were guests of honor at conventions or on the front covers of magazines being interviewed 15 years ago. Not around today. No idea where they are. They're not published. Who knows where they are nowadays? Uh, um, yeah. You know, I mean, and then you've got other people uh who've been work well a very good example recently was i was at a convention in glasgow in scotland um and i was hanging out with a guy called robert silverberg who is one oh. of the great masters of science fiction yeah and i love been uh, around, been around love... since the well, he was a fan in the late 40s and early 50s yeah. and then started publishing in the sort of like early 50s 1950s and he's one of the great masters of, of fantasy and science fiction and horror yeah. And uh, Bob and I did a book together. I, I did one of his. I did a collection of his horror stories a couple of years ago. We're going to do another one coming up. Um, they couldn't find a place for Bob on any programming at this convention. Wow! 
Um, and That's... you know, it was multi because they they're just not interested anymore in the old guys. They just, they're just, all they're interested in is their own little niches now, and it is so depressing. It really is so depressing. So I spend a yeah. lot of my time now doing historical books. I look, I do books about the genre, looking back. Yeah. Um, to try and because I, mean, I they're the kind of books I'd loved when I was 12, 14 years old. I I grew up reading Carlos Claren's horror movies because that's the only place you could find out information about these horror movies. Because you know, for me, they weren't on television at that point. You rarely got them back at the cinema again. So you know, it's how we learned about things. It's how we learned about the genre. Um, and it's just such a shame now to me that all of that is being lost. All that knowledge is being lost. Um, you know, we've, we, we've, we haven't got that many people left with us who go back as far as the 50s, let alone the, you know, the 40s or the, or the 30s. Anymore. Yeah. Um, and we should utilize them. We should hear their stories while, we, while they're still with us. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I, I spent Absolutely. a lovely lunchtime with Robert Silverberg. And he has been to every single British world science fiction convention since the first one in the 1950s. Do you think somebody would want to hear about that stuff? Of yeah. course. I, I love Robert Silverberg. I think one of the first books I read from him was like the Crystal Tower or the Glass Tower. Mm -hmm. um, great, great stuff. Paul Anderson, another person who, you know, yeah, I, 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 I met Paul Anderson back in the day. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. mean, all those guys. Um, uh, you know, they all came out of that same period. They were late after the pulp magazines. Yeah. Um, and kind of just before, I mean, paperbacks were around, but paperbacks really didn't come in until the late 50s, mid to late 50s. So they were in what were called the digest magazines, which were the little pocket magazines. Yeah, pocket yeah magazines. little, little blocky um, and magazines. That's where they, they, were like, like a, they were a bit between pulp magazines and paperbacks, basically. They were they fell between those. Again, I collect those as well. I collect everything. Um, sure. Like Like Omni and stuff like that. Oh, that's much later. That's eighties. Later, Omni is 80s. okay. Yeah, that's Twilight Zone's eighties. Okay. But um, um, I think that <clears throat> the role of, for example, of anthologies, it's um, it's like a doorway to a genre. Can be a doorway to a genre, definitely. I mean, I, I was talking about Paul Anderson and Robert Silverberg because you brought them up, and I my first experience with anthologies was sci-fi anthologies, and that mm -hmm. got me into a lot of different names. You know, uh, Isaac Asimov, like I said. Uh, other people like that um but it's it's such a a, a wonderful sampler uh an anthology can be such a wonderful sampler it can be a yeah. bridge the connection between genre and author and and the reader and genre and um i think it's really interesting that being in a position to be an editor and making so many anthologies how do you balance getting older voices with new voices how, how does that work you ask the older voices to send you a story and you ask the younger voices to send you a story. <laughs> um, and sometimes you get them, sometimes you don't. Now, the problem yeah. is, I'm, I've just, I'm actually putting, I think, four anthologies together at the moment here for publication next year. Um, and I try to get that balance. And, of course, the problem is now there are fewer and fewer of those old voices still alive and still writing. Um, one of the books I'm doing next year uh, is all old stories. So that's not so difficult. Um but for the new for the for the new original story anthologies, it is becoming harder to find some of those older voices now, and also finding good new voices because mm -hmm. you know I mean everybody's published now. You can just go and pu you publish yourself on Amazon anytime you like. Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, and that's the problem. There is just I mean, it's just so many people screaming into the wind at the same time. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's just it's 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 staggering. Um, and one of the things is interesting what you were, you were saying there, Jose, about um, a, a stepping stone. I've always, since the very first anthology I did back in the in 1987, I've always done uh, story notes, either before or after the story, talking about the author, mm -hmm. so that if you like the story, you'll go, you'll it'll give you some sort of leads to other books they've done, or other you know other collections or other things that novels they've done. Um, so it, it's a kind of way of spreading the message. It's a way of actually telling you know people like yeah, if you like this guy, check this out. You you might like this as well. Um, and I think that's very important. So all my anthologies or most of my anthologies will always contain story note, notes on the authors, always, um, and sort of like a further reading thing in that way. Yeah, going back to the Shadows in Eden. I mean, this mm -hmm. really uh, you can know a lot about the author's work, but you sometimes 
you don't know any, anything about their life or who they are. And, you know, yeah. you don't really follow, you just read that. You just bought the book at the airport and you're reading the book, but then you're like, huh, this is interesting. Uh, this has themes I am interested in. I wonder who the author is. And then you go and you check it out. But this one, first of all, like, how did you, I'm sorry, did we get to the part where how you met Clive? <laughs> I'd, already met, I'd already met Clive before I did that book. <laughs> right, yeah. right. So, um, how did you guys meet? Um, as you know, Clive comes from Liverpool, which is up north oh. of England. I, I live in London, which is down south in England. Um, Clive was, you know, a reasonably successful theatre director up in Liverpool with a dog company. Uh, people like Doug Bradley and P. Atkins and the rest of them up there. And then Clive decided he wanted to come down to, to London because that's where the action was and, right. and basically, um, you know, do more down here. Well, as I, I mentioned earlier, Ramsey Campbell, who also comes from Liverpool and was pu first published back in the 1960s. Um, he, I'm sure you know this story, guys, but um, he went to um, Clive's school. Yeah. To talk to the class. And he... Um, he basically talked about becoming being a horror writer and, and, and being an author and whatever. And, and Clive was very um, uh, taken with Ramsey's little speech and, and had a chat with him afterwards. And they and they remained in contact. Sure. So when Clive moved down to London, he really didn't know that many people, especially in the genre. So Ramsey basically said, Clive, go and see this guy, Steve. He knows everybody down there. Hang out with him. And, uh, you know, so... He did. I mean, Clive, I think I think Clive phoned me up. Um, said, hi, my name's Clive Barker. I'm in, you know, I'm, I'm, I've come down from Liverpool. Ramsey Campbell recommended I, I, I get in contact with you. And so myself and my girlfriend at the time invited Clive around to this house and he came around for dinner and, you know, had chili on a plate on his knee. Wow. We don't have a dining table. Um, and at that point, the first three books of blood were just coming out from Sphere in paperback. And I actually had advanced copies and I had three advanced copies here. So my copies are actually signed pre-publication by Clive. Wow. Uh, downstairs. Uh, so that was interesting. And I, I, I genuinely like them. I mean, I, I was I was one of those people who, who read them. Review, I, did I, I can't remember if I reviewed them now or not, but I genuinely like the stories because they were like anything that was coming out at that time. Um, so so, so you we became Clive, friends. You, you met him a couple of years then before you were unit... Uh, publisher for Hellraiser. Oh, long time before, long yeah. time before, because um, uh, we became friends. One of the things we used to do, because uh, again, all about meeting and, and, and mixing with people, is we set up a series of regular pub meetings in London. Uh, every few months, uh, we would have an, uh, what was basically an open night in an upstairs at a pub somewhere in central London where fans could come along, have a drink, have a meal, and mix with professional writers and editors and publishers and artists and people like that. So Clive started coming to those um, regularly. I mean, he would, you would be there every three months he would turn up. Ray Harryhausen would be at some of them. Other you know, writers who were in town. Stephen King came to one. Wow. Um, you know, we had we, people, people would pop in if, if we were doing something in town. Um, so Clive very much became part of the scene, you know, part of the genre, the fantasy scene. Obviously, Books of Blood took off here very quickly, very successfully. Um, he was making a name for himself. Um, but again, like a lot of these guys I grew up with and, and worked with, he was always very generous with his, his time and, and stuff. I mean, one of the things I mentioned earlier was that back in 1977, David Sutton and I launched one of the first digest magazines in this country for fantasy and horror, a thing called Fantasy Tales. And we published it ourselves. We had a thousand copies of each issue. Uh, we had Michael Moorcock and Ramsey Campbell and Dennis Etchison and Charles L. Grant, sure. all these kind of guys, Fritz Leiber, Robert Block. They all contributed to the, to the magazine over the years. And when I asked Clive for something, he gave me the Forbidden, which was basically what became Candyman. Candyman, yeah. Yeah. But we published it first. We published it before Books of Blood. Wow. Uh, oh. I, I can guarantee we did that because um, when we went to Clive's house in North London for the launch party of those books, of the second three Books of Blood, we took copies of Fancy Tales along to give out to people. We already had them. They were printed. They were done. Um, so technically, we were the first publication of, of The Forbidden. Um, 
which has a lovely double page spread artwork by John Stewart. He's no longer with us anymore. Yeah, oh, is that the, that's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Of the is candy that the one man, where right? there's like a, a black and white sketch of something coming through a door. Yeah, it's like a shambling guy. It's, 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 it's yeah, basically a candy it. man. It's a shambling guy with it. hair out. Yes. And then he's yeah. walking through the picture of the face, the, the doorway, doorway with the face above it on my yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, But it shows you how much I know, guys, because for that issue, the cover was a Ramsey Campbell story, mm-hmm. not the Forbidden wow. by Five. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so, so I'm which, not always which a great issue? editor, trust me. Which issue was that? Do you remember? Oh, I don't know. It's something like number 14. It's from right. the early 80s, hit, obviously. Um, time to hit eBay for that. Oh, yeah. I, I, there's copies still around. I've probably got something in my attic. I mean, you know, it, 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 it was it, color, it, by that time we were doing color, full color covers. Um, it's it's not a hard one to pick up at all. I mean, it's a hard one to find signed by Clive. He did sign it. Sure, them. sure. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, that was, that was nice. And then a little bit later on for number 17 which was the last issue we did um he gave us um the poem weave world uh Uh just you know the the cup the the two standards i think it is um and the original illustration for hill in the hills the cities um with the two heads and the two cities on top fighting each other he's black and white artwork Mm -hmm. right um so we did that as a double page spread in fancy tower 17 oh my god and then he just gave me the artwork as a present that's amazing. Wow. Is it is it hung up somewhere or no? It's not unfortunately. I, I, there's literally no more room on my walls. Plus, I oh, I'll, I'll bet. I didn't yeah. want it fading anywhere. Um, but no, I still have it. I've still got a couple of pieces of Clive's original artwork. Yeah, not the paintings, oh, unfortunately, but the black and white stuff. Yeah, right. And how does um when he when he starts Hellraiser, how how did you become the unit publicist? I mean, that was kind of a, <laughs> a big change of career for you, right? It, Were you well, already no, freelance at the time? Remember, I I I'd already been. I was already. A movie journalist so i was mm-hmm. used to going down on film sets and interviewing actors and directors and watching them film and whatever um and i kind of knew what they were doing wrong to be honest mm-hmm. with you i mean how they were getting it wrong because you've got to remember back in those days um most publicity that was done for a film was held until the film came out so you could go down while they were shooting it but you couldn't use your article or your interviews or whatever until maybe, you know, a month before the film came out. So I was in Los Angeles and I was doing an interview with John Carpenter. He was working on Big Trouble at Little China in Little China, mm-hmm. the 20th, 20th Century Fox Studios. And I was doing a, a big interview with, with, with John. He was lovely. And then he said, well, look, you know, the interview's finished. Why don't I take you for lunch, you know, in the, in the cafeteria at Fox and we, we can keep talking. So, you know, we went, and I was with my girlfriend at the time and another friend, a writer called Dennis Etchison, who'd introduced me sure, to John. Yeah. So we went to, we went to the cafeteria and Dennis and, and my and my girlfriend were chatting away and I was just chatting to John across the table. And he said, Steve, you know, why, have you ever thought about moving out to California? You know, because, you know, you, you, you know, the TV stuff and the video stuff and whatever, and you're into books and writing and whatever like that. And I said, John, honestly, you know, there are so many people out in California trying to make a career in, in movies, whereas I'm, you know, in London, I'm OK. I'm, you know, I'm doing quite well. You know, I'm, I'm, I've got a career. Might not be a big career, but I've got a career um, and I'm doing fine. And he said, well, have you ever thought about being a unit publicist? And I went, no. And he said, well, you know, because of your background knowledge of films and, and TV and the fact, you know, you're a writer, that's exactly what you want from a unit publicist. So I went, oh, that's kind of interesting. So when I got back to London, I phoned Clive and I said, Clive, that shitty little movie you're making, if you got, I couldn't even remember what the name was. I said, have you got a unit publicist for it? And he said, Steve, no, we haven't, we can't afford one. The budget's so low. We, you know, we, they, they won't give us enough money to even have a unit publicist. Right. And I said, well, what if I said I'd be a unit publicist? I'll take three months off my job and I'll, you know, they, they don't pay me, you pay me um you know and i'll you know he's like you don't have to pay me i'll just come along and do it for the experience Mm -hmm. and he said well he said that would be great i'd love that but he said i can't make that decision you'd have to talk to my producer so i said okay that's fine so he said look let let me talk to chris fig and uh we'll we'll arrange something so um uh a couple of weeks later i think it was after work i met chris fig in a a wine bar in in the Mm -hmm. street where my offices were in london and we went downstairs. It was, it was like 
underneath the street. Um, had a couple of bottles of wine, talked about things. Um, I said, look, yeah, Chris, you don't have to pay me. I, I'm earning a very good wage from my own company because I was a, a partner in my own TV company. And he said, no, no, no. He said, he said we, we would definitely pay you. We would definitely pay you. Even if it was just minimum. I said, well, OK, that's what you want to do. And by literally by the second bottle of wine, I got the job. I had the job. Um, and he said, yeah, you know, you, you got the job. You're 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 you can be our publicist. Fantastic. And uh, what was the what was the movie journalism on TV around that time? Was it Barry Norman? And were there like nighttime TV shows that would tell um, you on TV? Movies were there done? were a couple, but Barry Norman was the most famous one. He had a he had uh, a, a, a series which on BBC, which was called Film whatever year it was so film right, right. 76 film 77 film 78 whatever it would be um there were some other programs out there as well i i'd created my own magazine called shock express at this time as well because there weren't any film fanzines in england uh there was what was that know, name again? in america sorry what was the name again uh shock express but it's express oh. with an x i've read issues of shock express so yeah so, i mean it was a big it was a big thing back then yeah 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 well, that's me. That was mine that. as well. I created that. Oh, you created I that. I, I, I love I created that issue with, with Frank on the cover smoking. Of that's... course you do. <laughs> tearing, tearing Julia's heart out. It's a gorgeous, <laughs> it's a gorgeous cover. And it's such a good magazine. That explains a lot. I never really oh. looked closely at it, but I'm sorry. Yeah. I, wasn't I just the, I realized. Was the editor. I mean, basically, I didn't have time because I was doing so much other stuff. So I got other people to edit the magazine, but I was the publisher. I mm -hmm. put the money in. I, I, did the copy editing, the design. It was just a few issues, okay. right? It, it didn't last long. It lasted, mm, it lasted for about, again, 15, 20 copies. Not even okay. that, even. Okay. Not even yeah. that. Yeah. Um, it began as a sort of black and white with one color or two color covers. Uh -huh. And then we moved into full color covers. But it, there was just nothing like it in, 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 in the UK. There were a few, you know, magazines in America, especially coming out right. of New York. Fangoria. And it's more to do with that sort of you know, gore zone type stuff. It's more flattery yeah. things, that kind I, of stuff. In those I still days. have a bunch of binders full of Starlog magazines and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, it was Starlog. And I also, I mean, I worked for Halls of Horror, which was Hammer Halls of Horror. Um, I worked for Cine Fantastique, yeah. um, you know, those kind of things. I was Forrest J. Ackerman's British editor on Monster Land. Wow. And I, I wrote for Famous Monsters of Film Land. And I have my, my first article. The last my issue, last right? article. In the last issue, yeah, of the yeah. last issue. Uh, by then, Fury had gone, but he remembered oh. me. And uh, when he started up his new magazine, he, he came to me and, and made me his British editor, which was great. He, he was such a great guy. And I just recently saw his, uh, there's a documentary I saw that he was hosting about uh, monkeys in film or apes in film. It's <laughs> it's hilarious. It's so funny. He was um, a great guy. I, I first met him again. In the, I, I was in Los Angeles in the early 70s. I went with my 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 mum. And mm -hmm. my sister to Los Angeles. And because I was a reader, I wanted to visit his house. Uh -huh. And uh, I found It was every kind of a pilgrimage we... location for yeah, a lot of people. Yeah, well, I mean, I'd seen all these incredible photos. And to be honest with you, this house is based on his house, the Ackerman. Sure, sure. Um, and I, um, I phoned him every single day we were there. And nobody picked up. It was just the answer phone machine every day. And on the very last day we were in Los Angeles... I phone the number again. There's a click. He picks it up. And I, I, I was gobsmacked. And I was like, uh -huh. oh, my God, Forrest Ackerman. And he said, well, you know, why don't you just come over to the house, Steve? You never met me. Didn't know who I was from Adam. Sure. And my mother, God bless her, gave me the money, put me in a cab, and sent me over to this strange man's house on the other side of Los Angeles. <laughs> um, I arrived. There was a group of other people there. He took me on a tour of the house. And then took us all out for lunch. At, uh, wow. You know, you know, it was a house of pies. Um, and I got to meet other people at the same time. And then other time, every time I went back to Los Angeles, I would go and visit the house, go and visit him and his his wife, Wendane, who has the same birthday as I have. Um, well, birth date. Um, and he would always make me very welcome. When it was the first um, Famous Monsters convention in virginia he paid my way i was you know he paid my way to go out there and and see it um and again he was very much a mentor to me for i i mean you know you hear stories about him now some of which i don't know if they're true or not i certainly 
had no problems with him. I never saw any problems with him. He was just a, a guy who loved horror films. And, and sure, horror, horror everybody stuff. has uh-huh. their own experience. But going back to the uh, the unit publicist thing then, so hmm. So were there... said, yeah, you start. Yeah. And I, I went, okay, fine. And I, and the great thing was they were filming it literally two stops on the London Underground where I, from where I lived at that time. Mm-hmm. So in the oh. morning, I could just jump on the tube train, go two stops on the tube train, get off, walk up the hill and i was at the, i was on location at the house cricklewood right uh, yeah Dollis well Hills it, it's kind of cricklewood yeah i yeah. mean it's it's a bit it's, it's dollis hill basically is where it was right um and i it was on my it was on my tube line so i just caught the underground train every morning i mean i wish all films were that easy oh, so yeah. it took me 10 minutes to get to the location right um and it was a little place called the production village which really was like a production village it was like mm-hmm. a few it was like it looked like a motel. It was very weird. I don't know. Why, I don't know. I think it was set up as a TV thing. They had a sound stage, but it wasn't soundproof, mm-hmm. which caused problems. I, I remember um, like, Simon Banford telling us about the ducks quacking outside while they were shooting. Well, there was a <laughs> pond. There was like it, it was yeah. like the reason it was like a village was there was a duck pond literally in the middle with these buildings situated around it. Uh, <laughs> but most of the time we were at the house. I mean, you know, up on the hill, it's still there. You can still visit it today. It looks exactly the same from the outside. Um, and you know, we were set up there most of the time because we shot, it was very little, I mean, it was very little breakaway. If you know what that means, it wasn't like you could raise the ceilings or move a yeah. wall out the right. way right. and get the shot. We had to work, you know, if we were shooting from the stairs, there was 30 people crammed in on the stairs, looking down right. with a yeah. camera. You, you can't know? just <laughs> knock a wall down. It's not a set. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was an actual set. house. Um, yeah. you know, if, if they use smoke or feathers in, in the room, that smoke and feathers went all through the house. You yeah. know, we were all like <laughs> coughing behind the camera. Um, but it was a great learning experience for me yeah. because um, I, as I said, I'd been on film sets before. Clive and Chris trusted me implicitly. They were, they, they from the day one, they just, they gave me my head. They said, look, you do what you want to do. Um, obviously, you have to run it all past us, which is fine. So I came up with a plan. Um the one thing, as I mentioned earlier, was that, you know, films didn't really do publicity until they were just about to be released. Now, that's fine if you're a big movie and you've got the whole publicity campaign behind you and, and you know, it's a major studio like Fox or Warner Brothers or somebody like that. But when you're a little small independent movie, which is what we were, I mean, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a very low budget movie, much, in fact, much more lower than New World later claimed. Um and uh you know in those days new world were, were churning these films out every month there's another horror movie or there's house or you know whatever these things near dark all this stuff was coming out around that same time so i made the decision the conscious decision that we would start the publicity on day one of shooting we would we would start getting publicity rolling and get that word of mouth rolling so that by the time hellraiser came out in eight months time or wherever it would be Everybody would know about it. Everybody would be looking forward to it. So I had some little button badges made up that we gave to everybody who came down on set, which which basically said there are no limits. And I've still got you know a few over here um, yeah. of the original button badges. We had T-shirts made up with Clive's artwork of, of Pinhead on to, to give to crew members and whatever. Um, and then the other thing I did, which nobody had, I'd ever seen do before, was I... On the first day, I made up a press kit. Uh-huh. Um, again, using Clive's artwork on the front, casting credit information, little stories about the actors, little stories about the production crew. And then every time I brought press down on the set, they got one of these press notes then. So they could start cribbing from that. There were quotes in there. If they didn't have, if they didn't, you know, if that person was on the set that day, they could start using that for background material. I was giving stills to people. So they had they had the use of stills, and we we did campaigns in the trade magazines here and and in and in California. I would put little stills out showing us you know behind the scenes in production. Look at this. What look what's coming? Um, and of course, the one thing that we didn't really trail very high was the Cenobites because they were such a small part of Hellraiser. Um, right. You know, they they came in if they came in for a week, I'd be surprised. Um, Because basically Hellraiser was about Julia and her journey and killing the guys and and Frank. 
Um, and although we had this amazing imagery, thanks to Bob Keane and image animation, um, it was just part of the whole Hellraiser thing. Yeah. So it wasn't um, it wasn't a major part of the publicity in those days. The only good thing was I was working very closely with magazines like Cine Fantastique, like Fangoria. The excellent Tony Tapponi was was editing that in the, the, the back in the day. Um, some of the French film magazines. And so I I could feed them some of these photos of the Cenobites and start getting that that word of mouth out there. These these we, really weird images. Um, and it, it so worked. Basically, you were generating hype for the movie. That's what yeah, generating hype, but yeah. generating hype yeah. eight months beforehand. Right, right, right. So the, and... the, the fans knew about this. So I would get, you know, Kim Newman would come down on set and do interviews with everybody. Um, Neil Gaiman would come down on set and do interviews with everybody. I had people coming all the time, coming down. And, you know, a lot of that stuff, they would write, they'd write like little teaser stories and then hold back the, the big stuff for closer to when the film came out. So that by the time the film came out, all that stuff was done. You know, right. we, and they, they were going to have press junkets for Hellraiser. They were going to have a hotel room with Clive sitting in there and a couple of actors talking to the press. All that stuff was done. And then, of course, the, you know, the big thing I did was was the electronic press kit, um, which I didn't invent, Jose, although I understand right. you think I might have invented the EPK. <laughs> no, no, I understand. I didn't that. invent yeah. the EPK. Uh, I, I do were, have... I do have uh, press kits and uh, electronic. Pre I think the only electronic press kit I have, actually, you might have made it. It was that Best Cutler Gallery tape. Uh, no, I didn't. My... Oh, no, okay. I didn't do that one. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Um, there were EPK because video, of course, was coming in in the eighties. It was a new. Right. It was a new thing, and uh, because I'd been working for a video company since the seventies. I pretty much knew how videotape worked. I mean, I knew everything about it because that's all I'd be. I'd been working on film as well, but I also was working on videotape. And um, as I said earlier, you know, they had no budget for publicity on Hellraiser at all. And the fact that you know Chris insisted on paying me every week was was absolutely lovely of him. Um, but then I went to Clive and Chris. I said, "Look, I can do your budget." using my, my the production companies I've worked with before and obviously not charging myself out because I'm already working for you. And I can get us three days of video filming behind the scenes, doing interviews with Clive and the cast, the other cast and crew members, shooting behind the scenes footage so that when you're finished, you'll have five, six hours worth of material that New right. World can use. Right. And... They said, well, look, we'll have to run that past um, New World. I said, that's fine. Here's the budget. I've done a budget for you. It's all listed there. Um, and we were also working through New World's London Publicity Office, who really didn't do anything. Their job was simply to pass the stuff on to New World. Um, and so I had to report to them. They had certain requirements. We can talk about those if you want in a minute. And... Um, yeah, the, he came back. They, they, I don't know whether it was Tony Rand or whoever it was. Somebody at New World okayed the budget for the EPK. And so I brought the crews in. Um, we shot. I, I brought them in one day when we were doing the Cenobite. So at least we had, you know, makeup stuff going on and stuff on the on the set and all that. Right, right. And then we did interviews with everybody. It was, it was some cool stuff. I mean, it was some really, wow. really nice stuff. Um I saw some of that stuff on the Quartet of Torment release. Uh, you it's... saw all I have because yes. oh, wow. of that five hours when filming was over, that all went off to New World in, in Los mm -hmm. Angeles. Um, and, uh, you know, with all the other publicity material, that, you know, the black and white negatives, the color transparencies, all my finished press notes and stories and things, all that got shipped to to California, to, sure. uh, to New World. And I was actually, I, I went out to New World a few months later and they, they they took me to the office and I said, oh, you know, do you, you, you got everything from the shoot. And they said, yeah. And they took me downstairs into a basement <laughs> and it was like that scene from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh, it was wow. piled high with movie posters, lobby cards, press wow. kits, everything. As far as you could see, the problem was, guys, 
There was no rhyme nor reason to any of it. It was just oh. a total mess. Oh. Um, and they never did anything with that material. I mean, I guess... as far as... I, guess I don't, even, I don't like know what you. happened to it because yeah. New World got sold and then they got sold again and they got mm -hmm. split. So yeah. nobody knows where that video material is. But luckily, luckily, I'd already used some, about five, six minutes of it, um, for other things. Right. Um, particularly, the most I think the most famous shot in the world is Clive behind the camera looking through the viewfinder of the camera. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. On location. Yeah the street uh -huh. um and so when we were doing you know the the new blu-ray i went through all the stuff i had in the house all 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 the video all the old vhs tapes um of of rushes from all the films and um i found that's the stuff you saw on torment that's all i've got which again wow. i think is about six minutes worth of material that um, was in real I, I was good lucky shape to if have it was that. on tape yeah I mean, if it was on if it was on tape, it's still in very good shape because um, it looks great on the Blu-ray. Yeah. Well, when, when we, when we were uh... sorry, go on, go on, when, when go we on, were man. reading about the your your story on in the Phantasmagoria, um, oh, such a good volume. We had talked a little bit about it, and and you could probably shed some light on this, but I I was wondering if if you hadn't been involved in Hellraiser, if it would have been only a cult hit instead of a commercial success. Yes and no. Um, I think Hellraiser would always have been a success, but not mm -hmm. upon release. I think the thing yeah, that made Hellraiser again, of. the thing that made Hellraiser again is the video age. It was the, it was the date of the time of VHS tapes. Um, it was a time when you know a film would come out, it'd play the drive-ins, which is really what they thought Hellraiser was. They thought it was a drive-in movie, um, mm -hmm. and then. You know, two months, three months later, the VHS would come out and people could re remember rent it in those days. Not yeah. even buy a VHS, you could only rent it. Yeah. And New World, of course, were the kings of, of the VHS releases. And they, you know, all their stuff was on VHS. And that's I mean, a lot of their stuff was made just for VHS, you know, stuff shot in Argentina mm. or whatever. Um, and it was and it was VHS that basically broke Hellraiser through. And and People, you know, the kids were renting it, but then they were renting it again, and then they were showing it to their mates, and then they were having parties watching it and whatever. So, so was... Hellraiser would always have been the success it became. I have no doubt of that. Well, All what, I was did it also was help get it out to a wider audience initially, so yeah. people were aware of it initially. So when it did hit, people went, "Oh yeah, that film with the guy with the pins in his head. Yeah, I know well, that one." Or where the woman hits the guy with a hammer or something. Yeah. Yep. yep. Well, was it <laughs> also the, Was it also the um the publicity that you generated at the start? Did that uh did that contribute to them deciding to do put some extra money in to do the enhancement shoots like the resurrection of Frank and stuff like that or was that all or that that was Not at and, all. No. Okay. Um I and in fact, I have transparencies of the original Frank sequences when we shot oh. them. Oh mm -hmm. wow! But they're on color transparencies, and we and unfortunately we we couldn't. Well, Trevor, who did Fantasmic Corey, did such a such a fabulous job on this. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Uh, you know, again, I'm I I do the I do this series with the editor <laughs> Trevor. Yeah, I um, mean this special series of of, of books. Um, which we do. So I opened up my archive for this and for, for the Blu-ray. Um, and so a lot of the black and white stuff, and I mean, I've got, I kept everything again. I've got all the files. I've got all the scripts. I've got all the shooting schedules. I've got everything from every single movie I ever worked on. Um, and story and, that's been published, right? It's what, sorry? And stories that have been published and where they've been published. Uh, I've, I've done that as well for books. I mean, all my yeah. books are there are files, but I mean there are box files they're actually up here above my head here. Mm -hmm. And there's Hellraiser. There's three, and they're that big. They're bo they're literal box files. Wow. Um, and they've got everything in it, including a lot of black and white and color stuff that's never been seen. Um, I, that's wonderful. I uh, I appreciate a lot of the work that went into this one and all the stuff that you provided, including Hellfire that you wrote with Marshall Smith. 
And, oh yeah, well you can talk about like further down the line if you want on another show. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's a shame about Hellfire. I loved Hellfire. Uh, um, that would that would have brought some continuity to the series. Yes, and it, would have it kept would. It in yeah, more. that was it would the have plan. Been so good. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it yeah. would. But yeah, so um, yeah. I, as I say, I, I'm not taking any credit away from Clive or anybody or Bob Keane or anybody like that. But yeah, they um, by the time I I finished, I thought my job was over. Um, there were reshoots during shooting. I mean, uh, execs came over to keep mm -hmm. an eye on what was going on. Apparently, Tony Randall came over, but I don't remember meeting him at all. And he was an exec for um, for New World then. And you've got to understand, my role as a unit publicist, I fall between the two camps. So I'm I'm I've, I'm dealing with the actors and the crew over here. Mm -hmm. And then I'm dealing with the producers and the production team and the director and the script writers over here. Right. And my job is almost like a liaison between the two. And again, because I worked as a producer, as a director, as a writer, I knew all of that stuff. So I could talk to them on their own ground. You know, I could I could do all this stuff, which, you know, I was I was perfectly suited for this. I even if I say it myself. And so it worked like clockwork. Um, you know, people would go away. Journalists would go away with their big wadge of notes, their little button badges, their their black T-shirt with Hellraiser in red on it or whatever, yeah, which I've still yeah. got knocking around somewhere. Yeah. Um, and it was a format which I decided that's what I was going to do for all the films I worked on. And, it, and it, I, that's what I did. I basically just enhanced and repeated that and, 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 and honed that skill um for all the movies i worked on right into the 1990s and you um, acted like a liaison between the suits and the creatives and also yeah. you after that you found a way to use your skills to package the the art and send that over to the audience in the best possible way so they can come across it and well and, hopefully and i mean the problem easily. is you got to understand i mean I was still young. I was in my what was I in my twenties, thirties, something right. like that. And um, my 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 photographer. It, it always a lot of it comes down to who the stills photographer is on the movie. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And on Hellraiser, it was a guy called Tom Collins, an Irish guy who who'd been around the been around the houses a few times, um, and liked to drink now and again, shall we say? <laughs> um, lovely guy. Could not have been easier to work with. I've, I've worked with stills photographers who've been a real pain in the ass, but he wasn't. He was a lovely guy to work with. Sure. And as I said, working with the, the publicity company in London, there were certain requirements. We had to produce, I think, I, off the top of my head, don't quote me on this, I, I could be wrong, but it was something like 500 colour transparencies and 700 black and white stills. Wow. That's what we had to make sure at the end of the day, or Chris Fig had to make sure that's what he delivered. That was part of his contract with New World. Right. And we did that. And then, of course, you know, New World come out when the film is released. They release eight black and white stills that look kind of blurry and fuzzy. And, and it's like, what is going on here? It's like, and I've got the original set here. I've got the original press kits for all these films. And we gave you 700 stills and you have the original negatives. And you've produced these rubbish looking photographs. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly. Um, I have the press kits for Hellraiser one and two, I think three, and then Nightbreed. And yeah, the, the those stills are great, but sometimes you feel like I wish there were more of these. Um Yeah, and also the choice of stills. They pick some yeah. of the weirdest stills. Huh. It's like why you why have you got this still of these two people standing and having a conversation with each other? You know, that sure. kind of thing. It's yeah. just so weird. Um, and as I say, all that material, well, the good thing was, because I kept a lot of it, I kept a lot of those stills. I, I kept a full set, well, not a full set, but a big set of the color transparencies. I've got all that stuff still. Mm -hmm. And when Trevor said, and, and, and Arrow wanted to do the Blu-ray, I said, look, we'll only, I'll only get involved in the Blu-ray if we can do it properly. If we, you know, cause I've got, I'm, I'm not getting any younger. It's time to start sharing this material with the world you know it's it's there i've used it in books as you as you said jose i mean i've used it in books now and again and it's dribbled out over the years yeah. but now was the time to actually start sharing it start getting it out there so people could see it and also i thought the time was right i mean i thought the time was it's like your hellraiser is now a classic Absolutely. um 
of, of its time and and it's now time to like go back and say hey i bet you haven't seen this before i bet you haven't seen this before um so i i scanned a lot of material in um uh for for arrow uh for their their set and then as i already had that we we used that and some other stuff for phantasmagoria so uh as um, someone who got started into the genre by you know looking at a tv late at night and seeing frank wearing a suit saying i'm frank i'm uncle frank and i'm like what is that i saw that on on tv late at night um and that's how i got into clive was through hellraiser and then i think that what's interesting about these books and and the books that we're going to be talking about like videotapes from hell is that they kind of make this especially this one, Shadows in Eden. Again, I just keep going back to this one and the Nightbreed Chronicles and the Hellraiser Chronicles. We haven't even got to those. I'm not sure we're going to have time today to get to those. Oh, my anyway. God. Oh I my know. God. I know. We got like one hour left. But um, yeah. <laughs> it just kind of bridges <clears throat> the connection between visual horror and literary horror. And it, it just, it, it's such a rewarding thing. I, I feel like you're the kind of person that, I'm very scattered brain. I'm very ADHD. Uh, I you, people tell me things and I'll forget them in a minute. Sometimes I go into my collection. I find I didn't know I have this. I've rediscovered it. Oh, I do the and, same thing. Trust me. And and, <laughs> and it seems to me like you're a person who really likes to categorize information. Very methodical. Um, that you like to package and categorize. And you have use... to be methodical. That's the one. Right. That's the one thing I'll say. Um, when you're dealing with, especially if you're dealing with writers, uh, you can be a bit scatty now and again um you've got to be methodical you've got to know that's why why i've got everything in files that's where i know mm. if i'm looking for i mean i still lose stuff trust me i mean <laughs> i've probably got you know five thousand black and white stills on my shelves here you yeah. know i've got all sorts of stuff knocking around um and sometimes yeah i i i, I put them in the wrong place or i miss file things and, and all that you know that happens to me all the time um and when you're doing a book you have to be methodical. You have, and of course, remember back when I did Shadows in Eden, there were no computers. I did Shadows in Eden right. on a computer. Right. There was, there were no computers, yeah. no, no, no PCs. I had to do the whole thing, type it on a typewriter, put the manuscript together that way. Um, it was, it was a tough job to be honest to put all of that together. But like I was going to say on on Hellraiser, I couldn't have done my job on Hellraiser if it wasn't for the cast and crew. Um, as I said, it was Clive who got me the job by recommending me to Chris. And then Chris gave me the job. Um, and those two guys were just amazing to work with. They trusted me all the way through it. They backed me on every decision I, I, I wanted to make. But then, you know, you have to deal with the actors. You have to deal with the crew. Right. Well, you know, Bob Keane, Jeff Portas, all the guys at Image Animation, they opened up this studio to me because they'd never seen anything like this before normally they were working away nobody cared what they were doing nobody you know they, they were there at five o'clock in the morning doing the makeups and whatever nobody cared i mean they Throwing got nobody, nobody faxes around with it. <laughs> you know the background people and right. i was like no 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 my this is what my people want you're, you're my bread and butter for the for the you know for the monster magazines so you know we would do guided tours of, 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 of the makeup rooms and they would see the makeup being applied or the, the corpses being sculpted and all this kind of stuff i mean mm -hmm. fascinating stuff so that's they really the, liked it that's the movie magic right that's ultimately what's at yeah. the core of of this escapism is is just knowing that this is a craft and an art and and there's so much stuff that happens before the movie during but the, the movie problem is, that the problem we is okay, if, if you're a mainstream publicist right. you don't think about it. That. You think about, oh, I've got Brad Pitt or I've got George Clooney. People right. are going to be interested in talking to them. You, you think know, about the, had... a numbers game, right? It's going to, how many units can we move with this movie? How many discs are we going to put out? Yeah, but they don't, they don't, because they don't know anything about it. They don't even bring it into, 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 yeah. into, right. you know, I mean, into their whoever... thinking. Whoever chose the stills, for example, if they were into the culture of horror and stuff, they could have come up with better stills. Exactly. Exactly. And, and that's where, Publicists are so important because they know how to contextualize the material and they know how to present it. But in as, a way as that soon I... as it gets to the studio, mm -hmm. you're talking about somebody it's who's not just working on horror movies. They're working on action adventure movies. They're working on romance movies. They're working on thrillers. So to them, it's just one more film on a conveyor belt of films. Oh, it's coming out, you know, in this month. And we've got such such coming out the next month. We've got, you know, it's for them, right. it's just a conveyor belt. Yeah. So that was my one and only skill, really was because I knew about this stuff, I could at least supply people 
with what I thought they wanted. Um, but then, of course, I had to deal with the actors. Um, and, uh, you know, Andy Robinson was the biggest person we had. You know, mm-hmm. and, uh, and uh, I'm not going to say a star, not an American star. That would be wrong. But certainly a, a solid American character actor. We all knew him for mm-hmm. Dirty Harry. That was basically his Scorpio. biggest role. Yeah. Yeah. It was, you know, the crazy killer in Scorpio. Yeah. Um, I pretty much met him the first, the first day I went down on set. Could not have been more accommodating. It's like he said to me, he said, Steve, whatever you want me to do, I will do. I will, you know, just tell me where you want me, when you want me, I will do it. Clive was the same. Clive, you know, he's, he's, he's got a million things to think about, directing his first movie, having to worry about, you know, getting these shots in the can in time we've only got a certain amount of time to do it is this going to look okay i got the same thing whenever you know whenever i'm whenever i'm in between shots bring them over i'll talk to them i'll do that it was it was so cool um and then all the other actors i mean ashley lawrence you know who was starting out at that time and didn't really and you know her job was really had to trust me because you know she was she didn't really know how this worked and how all that mm-hmm. worked at that, at that sure. point. Um, and, and, and the other actors as well, um, you know, you know, they, you know, they had a certain experience, but a lot of them were theater actors. You know, they weren't used to doing a lot of movies or TV. Sure, Claire Higgins. And, yeah. Claire Higgins, again, I mean, could not have been nicer. So one of the things we, I used to do, um, we actually had lunch on a bus because there is no, there was no building. We, you know, uh-huh. we were on location. Uh-huh. So there's a double decker bus um the food was like laid out on tables just outside the house in the, almost in the street actually mm-hmm. and uh, i don't know what people driving past what was going on but i mean it was like weird and then you know we'd take our food onto the bus and eat our meals on the bus uh-huh. and so what i worked out was that was the time to get everybody so i would invite the journalists on set to join us for lunch come on the bus and do their interview with the actors while they're having lunch I mean, I don't. I can't great. think of, of a better way to connect to someone than yeah, over food. Yeah, it was social. Yeah, you know, they could they could sit there. They could they they, they could, the, the journalists got free food. And trust me, when you're a journalist, free food can make a big difference <laughs> to how you write about a movie, especially um, if you're freelance. Yeah, especially if you're freelancing. And so, um, at the end of the day, um, that's how we kind of worked it a lot of the time. You know, it's like we knew they were free for an hour at lunchtime. Uh, or maybe half an hour if they're going to make up again and whatever. Um, and so, and also I brought people back a second time because again on a film, some actors are only on for certain days or certain weeks and other actors are on for other days and weeks. So I would say to them, yeah, come on back. Yeah, do do some more interviews, come, come down. And of course, what the lovely thing was because it was such a small crew compared to a lot of Hollywood movies and certainly movies I worked on subsequently, um, we were like a family. And so once the journalist came back on again, something like Phil Nutman from Fangoria or Kim or somebody like this, Tony people Tim went, "Hey, love to see you again. You know, how's he going?" And they would just they sometimes they would just hang out for the day. They, you know, we only were finished. They yeah. would just hang out and chat and sit around and have a coke or whatever and just watch the filming and talk to people. Um, so it was a really nice atmosphere. It was a really good atmosphere. I gotta say. So basically, we're basically we're all geeks. <laughs> we're all we're all just big fans. No and, more than uh, I am, guys. I mean, as yeah. I said, yeah, I, I live in a house of geek. <laughs> we do have different experiences. For example, I mean, when you're an author, when you're a publicist, when you go to a convention, you experience it as a networking event. Whereas someone like us would just go there to starstruck and 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 go to the dealers' tables and stuff like that. Oh, so there there's a lot what do you more. Mean I do. First place I go to is the dealers' room. Sure. Yeah. yeah. That's true. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My curse. <laughs> All the stuff back there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yep. And how does uh, uh, Shadows in Eden come about? Um, so basically, um, I knew um, Underwood Miller, the publishers. Okay. Um, uh, um, Chuck Miller, Tim Underwood. Um, we got to know each other at World Fantasy Conventions back and forth over the years. Um, nice guys. Uh, did a lot of really beautiful books, both dead now, unfortunately, very sadly. But um, mm-hmm. they did beautiful, beautiful art books. They ran, I think it was something like the fifth world fantasy convention, which I was at, and they did the convention book that actually the book for the convention they did as one of their books. Um, 
And they approached me. They said, look, you know, by this point, of course, it's, you know, the early, late 80s, early or early 90s, I'm guessing by this point. Sorry, were you talking and, about and I, that uh, little publication from a fantasy convention called Clive Barker, Mythmaker for the Millennium? What's that? Oh, no, that was, I think that's later. Isn't it? that's oh, that's fantasy. later. Yeah, that's later. Yeah, yeah that's okay. British fantasy type thing that David okay. Howe did. But I mean, Clive is now sort of like big. I mean, he's now a big writer. He's done Hellraiser, whatever. And 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 Tim and Chuck came to me, mostly Tim, because he was the, he was the sort of you know the creative one. And he said, "Would you be interested in doing a book on Clive, Steve?" And I said, "What do you mean a book on Clive?" He said, "Well, just a book on Clive." And I went, "Hmm, let me think about it. Let me see if I can find a way into it." And so I talked to Clive, and I said, "You know, they want to do a book. I've got some ideas of how we could do this." And he said, all right, well, let's talk about it. So, you know, we, we talked about it. Um, again, as I say, there was no computers in those days. Everything was on bits, scraps of paper, bits of paper. And I thought about, OK, let's look at his journey by using articles by other people, newspaper interviews at different times in his career up to that point, articles about the films, articles about the stage shows, articles about the books, the reviews. Interviews. Uh, but then... I came up with this idea of doing the sidebars. If you look through the book, there's like little sidebars, little things cut out and, you know, like little boxes and all of this. So it's like, it was like a scrapbook, little bits of artwork, it. little stills. The whole thing was put together like a scrapbook. Yeah. But if you read the stuff in the, in the sidebars, either side of the page, it's extra material for what you're reading in the main text. Of course. And again, I hadn't seen anybody do this before. Now, to be honest with you guys, the way I laid that book out was I cut all those things out and stuck them on the pieces of paper to show Underwood Miller what to do. Yeah. You use a little bit of a sidebar idea also with A through Z of horror. Well, yeah. trust me. Again, once you've got a good idea, you don't waste it. Of course. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and that's an even worse story. If, we'll get onto, if we get onto A to Z of horror today, that's a terrible story. I'll tell you about, oh, about no. that in a minute. There's a terrible voice, several terrible stories about that. Um, but yeah, and so Clive, very generously, I think he'd already moved to Los Angeles by this time, was about to move to Los Angeles, opened up his life to me. He went, yeah. he said, look, come to the house. I can't remember. I think I did it both in London and in Los Angeles. I, I went to both houses and he had crates of stuff, like crates of paper and notes and reviews yeah. and boxes things. and binders yeah but all that kind of stuff absolutely yeah. and so i was allowed to go through it and pull stuff and 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 find little things but of course i had a lot of this stuff anyway i mean you know i i'd been to see i was i was you know on preview night i went to see the secret life of cartoons when it was on you know in london so i had the little brochure from that oh, my God. oh wow yeah and I had, you know, the magazine. Of course, I had the magazines because I worked with the magazines. Of course, I had all that stuff. Of course, I had all the books. Of course, I had all of that stuff. So it was it was a matter of me just supplying Underwood Miller. Oh, no, I can't Here's see what that is. I put my glasses on. Wait a second. Here's the Secret Life of Cartoons play. Oh, right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> awesome. The play, the play script. Um, so I already had a lot of that visual material anyway, Again, we didn't have scanners in those days. I had to shift it all off to Underwood Miller. They would then scan it in, and they were in San Francisco. And then they would ship it all the way back to me. And then I'd get, I'd return stuff to Clive, or I'd copy it out, and you know all that kind of stuff. And it took, in my mind, I can, in my mind, I think it took two years to put the book together. Oh, um, yeah. Um, it's such an excellent piece. But that's, yeah. Well, it, for its time, it is. I mean, you know, it obviously became, it's quite dated now because it only runs up to, what is it, 1992 or something like that? I think. Yeah. Like, like, it, yeah like that. I think. But the bibliography at the end shows everything that was published by 1991. Well, again, it's having that steel trap mind. I am I am yeah. a huge bibliography guy. Whenever I do a you know, a nonfiction book, there's an index, there's a bibliography, there's all that kind of stuff. I like lists. I always I, I mean when that. I was a kid, when I started going to movies in the mid 60s, I started typing my reviews on little index cards, you know, the little white index cards, uh -huh. and then put them into an index box. And so I would type the credits, like who the actors were, 
where I saw it, what the title was, what the date was on the front, and then on the back of the card, on a manual typewriter, not even an electric typewriter, right. I would type a little review of what I thought of the film and give it five stars. You know, how many stars out of five on the back? Wow. Uh, <laughs> I have seven boxes still down here by my desk of those cards. They oh, my God. Oh. And I That's updated amazing. them. Whenever I went and saw a film again, I would update the card to show that I'd seen it more than once. And I'd, maybe my review would change because I I changed and, and you know, my, my views had changed or whatever. Um, and I tell you, I, I did that up to 1987 when I worked on Hellraiser. And by then I lost track. I, by, I, I never got back into it because by then, you know, months had gone by. And I'd seen films and, and I never quite got back into it again. But those cards have served me well over the years for movies, and especially on A to Z of Horror. If I wanted to check out a movie, I just pulled out the card and saw what I thought about it or, TV, you know, whatever. And, and I basically had a mini review of it right there, ready to go. Wow. And, you know, and that's, again, before things like International Movie Database existed. And I mean, now I, mean, I used to do reference books for films. You can forget that now. All that sure. stuff's online, you know. I mean, not necessarily correct. I right. mean, my my stuff was taken off the TV screen. I would sit there with a notepad, go through the go through the movie on the VHS or record it on a, you know record it off the screen. Mm -hmm. Get the spellings right because so often actors' names were spelt wrong in books or they gave the wrong credit for the writers or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I tried to make sure that all my stuff was first generation. It's stuff right. I can say, yeah, I saw that. Straight from the material. Nothing here so. Yeah. And and I've done that again, I do it with stories for anthologies. Um when you reprint a story over years, it's like Chinese whispers. This editor may change a few words. The American editor may change the spellings, then the British editor will change them back again, and things like that. So that story gently changes between various oh, publications. Yeah. I see. And so when I do books of older stories, I try to go back to as early a source as I can to get the story as it originally appeared, not the version that maybe has gone through 20, 40 reprintings over 60 oh, decades, six decades. Right, right, right. Um, and I guess that's my little mental quirk. You know, it's, it's like, you know, it's like straightening the tassels on a carpet. Making sure that all the tassels are straight, you know. Looking at the of. original intentions and how it was, and also how it evolved. I mean, a lot of stuff in these books that you've made, um, you know, uh, about horror movies and the art in horror movies and stuff like that, they are so chock full of information. It's, it's perfect for, uh, for example, you know, I'm going to move to another book, but still, the Shadows of Eden one. <laughs> I did not know that Clive was an artist uh, until I read this book. Or so a playwright, right? I didn't know that either. I didn't know he had written plays until I read right. this book in 1991. That's how much... Um... Well, that was the whole point. I mean, that was yeah. my brief, was yeah. come up with a book about Clive Barker and tell people how great Clive Barker was. And even though, yeah. there are, even though nowadays it seems like every book, every author has like a book about his career or every book... Uh, well, Stephen every... King has many. Even I've done a yeah. book about Stephen King. Every movie yeah. has an art book coming out, especially if it's got special effects and stuff like that. But back then, we didn't get that. We got Starlog or Fangoria or, or whatever. And I still find stuff in those magazines that I buy. Every time I see a Starlog, I buy it. And it's like, I still leaf through it. I'm like, I've never heard of this movie. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I'm going to look that up right yeah. now. Oh, um, yeah. Well, well, and speaking of that, going through uh, reading your um, the, the upcoming book, The Videotapes from Hell. Mm -hmm. right um, that comes out next month yeah 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 um there was a there were a ton of movies like wow i thought i'd seen a lot of movies but i i that blew me away how much stuff there was in there that i didn't know about let, let me hold it up so people oh can see it. yes thank you so much because i that was one thing i wanted to ask is what is this physically going to look like that's big that's yeah. a nice nice size coffee table book like eight and it's three not quarters as big as the 10. other ones i did i did the art of horror the art of horror movies and the art of pulp horror. This is in a slightly smaller, squarer um, format, which I like actually. Yeah, um, as you can see, it's got some nice spot varnish on the on the cover. Oh yeah, and that wonderful Graham Humphreys cover. Graham Humphreys yeah. cover, which we messed around a bit, a little bit here. Oh my gosh, uh, uh, Joe Dante. Joe Dante did the introduction. Um, there's lots of essays, including Pete Atkins has done an essay in here, and other writers, David Scott, and people like that. 
and oh. and Barker and and Hellraiser is in there a couple of times, three, maybe oh, three yeah, times. There's, yeah, there's two there's two Clive Barker spreads. They're all color, so yeah, it's all this kind of stuff. Nice, yeah, yeah. all the way God. through. You know, Godzilla is... and things. Um, uh, and people have done Ramsey Campbell's in here, Kim Newman's in here. They've all done little articles. Uh, yeah. Atkins has got a lovely piece, and we found some of those great African posters from Hellraiser and yes. yeah. Yeah. And things yeah. to put in there because they were done for video releases because they weren't done for the movies, they were done for the traveling video shows around Africa. Um, and I've got to admit, the reason I did the book is I've still got all my VHS copies in the attic. I kept them all. <laughs> wow. Oh, so boy. Here we pretty go. Pretty much half yeah. that book on my covers from upstairs. Wow. Yeah, I, kept, really? I kept everything. Um, I told you, I'm a, I'm a geek. And um, when DVDs came in and, and then Blu-rays, I just kept all the VHS cassettes. And I just put them upstairs. Good man. And one day I was up there and I was looking and I thought, you know, there's some really interesting box art here, which is different from the movie poster and it's different from, you know, stuff other people have seen, the DVDs. Sure. Yeah, and I thought I wonder if there's a book there, and I so I put the package together, and I went, oh yeah, you know what there is. I pitched it, they loved it, and so I spent I mean a lot of good stuff, um, which yeah. uh, I, I, which I, I enjoyed like... doing, and it was that I learned stuff because always on a book, if you learn stuff, yeah, that's worth doing at the end of the day. Oh, of course. Uh, a book can be not something that you do to convey knowledge, but also research to learn new stuff. But also then... the other thing, guys, is I any book I do, whether it's an anthology, whether it's a nonfiction book, whatever, movie book, if I don't have fun with it, I don't do it. Oh, I mean, sure. I, 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 I insist on having fun. I want, it, I want it to be fun for me. I want it to be fun for the contributors. I also want it to be the best possible book they can have. So I, you know, if somebody comes to me and says, oh, look, we want to do a, a print on demand book or something, I'll get in that. I'm not interested. I want to, you know, if I, if I do a book, I want it to be the best version. You know, when we did, when we did Phantasmagoria, we did the mm -hmm. paperback version. We did this hardcover signed version yes. as well. Yeah. Beautiful. He had never done a hardcover before, but we thought, yeah. well, this is the one we're going to do. That's the one I have. Um, yeah, you got the hardcover, and it was, I think, what was it, a hundred of these, I think, at the end of the day. Yeah, some, and it's got some in. nice, uh, and you guys did some nice autographs on it too. Yeah, well, again, with the, that was a shame because the guys were, we were hoping to have you know a bunch of centibytes with us at the launch, and they were off in Las Vegas or somewhere doing a oh, you know, sure. signing a convention. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, they would have come, and so they they all agreed to sign little book plates to go in it, you know, and um, and the paperback is still available. But here, I mean, here's a good example. Here's a picture I had that. We took on um, on Hell, Hellbound, Hellraiser Two. Oh yeah, uh, Ashley behind the scenes, just reading the script, learning her lines a week before the production began. Whoa. Nobody had ever seen that photo before. It had never been published before. It's That's been in amazing. my files. Been in my files since 1988. Such a I good thought, photo. Su such yeah. an upbeat photo that we nobody has ever seen before. And uh, yeah, well, th th this is another story. When we get onto Hellbound, if we get on it, get onto it this week or next week or whenever you want to do another one. Um, uh, I can tell you stories about that as well and how that changed. I anyway, think we... it's your show, guys. Now, what do you want to no, talk no, about? Absolutely. Um, I think if you're okay with that, we might have to bring you back because there's a I lot of so. stuff to talk about, at least for the AOZ of horror and all that stuff. Yeah. But, um, going on to the the the, the video tapes from hell. You're right. I mean, I still have a lot of tapes. I don't have everything with me that I had back in Portugal because when I moved to Portugal, like most people who moved to a different country, I only brought two suitcases and all my stuff was left behind. And I'll said, and I said, I'll get that later. But you know, you never get that later. And it's still there in a big apartment in, in Portugal. But here I constructed my own little mini collection. And I got some really cool titles. And some sometimes these tapes. Like Quentin Tarantino has a quote in the book that says that videotapes are one of the most durable formats that, that we ever created to put a, a film on. And if, at first I was like, well, DVDs and Blu-rays are better. But like, no, I mean, I've got DVDs that had DVD rot. <laughs> and I've got tapes from like this wonderful tape here from our favorite movie, Hellraiser. Um, it still works. It still works. It's, it's still I know. I, when, I, when I was doing the book, I, I found three VHS players upstairs. Plugged one in, worked straight away. 
yeah. <laughs> plug into a Wonderful. TV, plug into the mains, threw a video tape, VHS tape yeah. in there, you know, tightened it up, tightened the tightened the wheels up so that it wasn't it wasn't gonna oh you know, do that. Remember the whole okay. tape thing? Yep, yep. In, and in... put it in the machine, picture came up, looked fabulous. Look in fabulous. the er- drop out it... on it. In the early '80s, when uh, when you my parents show somebody, had, uh, Jose, that... show somebody what it looks like because kids out there don't know what a videotape oh. looks like anymore and how it there works. We, go. uh, we got killer tongue right here, which is turn really... it around because you know it's right. It runs on two wheels. You were talking yeah. on the little uh, yeah wheels that go here, and then the yeah. tape obviously is inside. That's it. It's just a tape, like a yeah. And I guess nowadays. It's funny because I obviously grew up with this, but there's actually young people who are getting into VHS collecting, and yeah, that, that is fascinating because you couldn't give them away ten years ago. You could, you could no. yeah. charity shops would, you know, thrift shops yeah, refused to take them. A quarter, ten cents for a tape. It's like they yeah. were just now away. They're, they're well. I mean, if they now they can be twenty dollars at, at, at um oh sure at, 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 you know shows or whatever. But if they're slabbed like comics are, um, they can be hundreds of dollars if not thousands yeah. if they've never been taken out of the uh the plastic is that wish master still in the plastic this this no this one is not in the plastic because i ah, i usually watch I my it was shiny uh, uh, yeah if, if you've not taken if you've never taken out the plastic and you've got one and you slab that it can be worth thousands i mean it's and amazing even these gigantic packages that we used to be like two tapes you had yeah. to watch it those. and then take the other tape put it back in this is Storm of the Century, a uh, great miniseries by Stephen King for our listeners. Uh, we've got, and then there were like weird formats, right? The Wizard of Oz 50th anniversary. I've got uh, that, yes. It's box lovely. tape has a book. It yeah, has a whole ba- book. It's basically, uh, um, it's basically what they did with DVDs. They've got a book yeah. in there. They, yeah. you know, it's got, they're, they're the extras. They're the videotape extras. Yeah. And now we got a book in the Quartet of Torment by Phil and Sarah, which is a wonderful book. Um, when when I was growing much, up Pretty in, much all in, Blu-rays come with or dvds come with right. blu-rays with blu-ray yeah. sets now i mean more and more you know you know i do commentaries as well and um um yeah pretty much everything comes with i mean i've just done a i've got a commentary coming out next month on, on this cruel britannia which is three movies oh um, oh i see and it's three british movies from the early 70s but of course that comes with a, a book now you know a little booklet with essays wow. and photos and things in it um um, that's from vinegar syndrome in the states so that that will come out um kim and i did two of the uh the commentaries and then kim did a commentary with another friend of ours barry forshaw who's in videotapes from hell but uh yeah interesting early british horror movies from the 70s well when i was growing up um and in the early 80s when my parents had to decide between getting a vhs tape player or a, they chose laserdisc because at the time, videotapes to buy were a hundred dollars, and laser discs were sixty dollars. That's right. And so they they said, okay, we're do you know if we want to buy our own movies, this is the one that makes the most sense. Of course, videotapes got cheaper, and laser discs stayed the same, and, and then so disappeared. But I mean, yeah. laser discs were very much a more trustworthy format because you know they they were play, they they played on a stylus like a record. But it was a- yeah. Like a like a laser stylus. Scratch them, of course. Yeah, it was a laser, but unless you scratch them, they were fine. Whereas, of course, tapes you got drop out; they could snap. They they wore out the more you rewound them and things yeah. like that. And again, I've, I've got some video discs in the book. Um, their covers were great as well. I've got some upstairs in the attic. I've got Dracula yeah. and and things like that. In fact, I've actually got I've got the Hellraiser box set of discs. Me too. Because, yeah. Um, yeah, he said I, I got mine from John Landis, who sent them to me as a present. Oh my gosh! Oh wow! He, he oh. was getting rid of them and just mailed them to me. <laughs> oh wow. said, Steve, I think Steve, I think I. Sorry about the name dropping, guys. Um, <laughs> you know, Steve, I think you know you're like you appreciate this more than I do. Uh, I mean, that lovely black box and that comes with a booklet, I think, if I remember correctly. Yes, and, yeah, it does. Yeah. It comes with a script. Yeah, it comes with I, a uh, script. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I, I have to show this gorgeous set of the classics. Oh, the universe. Yeah, I'm on some of those as well. I <laughs> this was uh, David J. Skull's personal copy that once he sold on Facebook, and I was lucky enough to get it. And I'm so sorry that he is gone. Anyway. Yeah, he was fabulous. He he and I, uh, we signed together many times at Dark Delicacies in, in Los Angeles. Um, he worked on a couple of my books as well. David Scow was a really, he's a true gentleman, and he knew what he was talking about. He was a great guy. And Absolutely. to be killed in a stupid car accident, 
uh, drunk New Year's driving accident. By drunk driving, yeah. Absolutely Just, ridiculous. It's yeah. so sad. But uh, all of the uh, essays here, most of them uh, focus on their experience uh, growing up and watching movies, directors and stuff. And uh, it's... Well, and at the start, it's the history of VHS, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I always actually... try to do that in the over, do an overview at the beginning yeah. of each of the books. I mean, art of horror, yeah. art of horror movies particularly, and that's got a lot of Clive stuff in it as well, and an art of pulp horror. It's like a little mini history Yeah. before you get into the book, so you know it's... where it's coming from. It's gorgeous. It's got different sections with, you know, you go all over all the the thrillers, the the killer monsters, the hammer horror uh, chapter and mm -hmm. all of this stuff in here. But uh, it's it's and independence good... and independent and direct to video and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, yeah. well, Steve Bissett helped me with that section a lot. Steve Bissett probably has a, or had a bigger VHS collection than me. And he was scanning all his covers in. And again, Steve came to me and said, you know, he's a very good comics artist if you know Swamp Thing and things Absolutely. like that. <laughs> and Taboo, of course, the magazine back in the I day. I had a few issues. And, um... and Steve said to me, any scans you want, Steve, you can have. And a lot of, he seems to like Bigfoot movies. A lot of the Bigfoot covers come from Steve Bissett. <laughs> he, seems to, he seems to be fixated on Bigfoot movies from yeah. the 70s and 80s. Um, but anyway, get back to the Hellraiser stuff, guys, because we haven't got a lot of time. And we always sure, talk about sure. stuff, stuff later. Well, um, you wanted to talk about E to Z of horror, didn't you? I did, I did. Yeah. So I feel like we, we always go back and get... talk about the movies another time. Trust me, we got, I'm always around. Sure, sure. Mm. So um, you can get me back for the for program a thousand. Okay. <laughs> so in regards to the A to Z of horror, um, what prompted that book? A to, and, Z, uh... a to Z of horror in England, A to Z of horror in America. That's right. <laughs> yes. yes, yes. A through Z, if that's what you prefer. How did that uh, the idea for the book and show come about? Um, I had nothing to do with the show. Um, the BBC, as, as far as I understand the story, this is what I understand. The BBC mm -hmm. came up with the idea of doing this show. Um, there'd been a show, and again, I talk about it, I think, in the, in the, in the videotape book, uh, This Is Horror, which Ted Newsom did, which was a, a, a big set of videotapes um uh with trailers it was mostly trailer material because trailer material wasn't copyrighted so you could use instead of using clips and paying for them from movies you could use clips from the trailers and oh. and get away with it mm. so he did a series of, of of shows called this is horror and he interspersed it with interviews with christopher lee and peter cushing and all sorts of other people roger corman um did it as a i think it was like 12 15 videotapes in a box set and then that also played television in in this country on the BBC. I don't know whether it ever played TV in America, but it played TV here, late night TV. It was a bit rough around the edges. Let's put it that way. To be kind to it, it was it was a it was it, and no no disrespect to Ted. He had no he didn't have any money to put it together, and he did a pretty good job. But it was basically the history of horror, and you can still find it on video out there. Um, and I guess the BBC decided they didn't want to do their own version. So they came up with this idea of a, again, don't quote me, 10 part episode, something like that, uh, 10, 10 episode series. Each episode would be A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, yeah. J, K, whatever. Right. And it would be 10 minutes, 15 minutes, five minutes based around a letter and, and a theme for that letter. Yeah. All right. Um, and... They went away and made this without any consultation to, with anybody, as far as I could tell. Uh -huh. um, didn't bother talking to any of the horror community, any of this. And then they decided to get Clive in to host it. Uh -huh. I, I mean, even Clive, I don't think, had anything to do with the actual program making. They basically brought Clive in to host, you know, to be like the the Rod Serling of the show. And just sure. come in at the beginning, the end. I think it. he may turn up, he does a bit of voiceover and stuff in the middle. Uh -huh. So they, I think they shot all that stuff in a couple of days. Anyway, while they're, while they're cutting this together, they go, and I'm not going to tell you my, my, who it is, but they went to a friend of mine who's very well known as a film journalist. And they said, look, we are, we want you to do the book. We want you a tie-in book because BBC Books, which was a different department to the BBC, um, decided they could sell a book. And they knew they could sell it to HarperCollins in America because they were Clive's publisher. So, you know, whatever they paid for the book in England, yeah, for the BBC version, they could sell the American rights, make their money back straight just on that, just on Clive's name. Sure. So my friend, 
who is a very, very good writer and a very good journalist, put together a pitch for them. I think he did some sample chapters, sent it to the BBC. They looked at it and went, no, we don't we don't like this. We don't, this is not what we want at all. This is, you know, this is this is not what we had in mind. Well, of course, by then, a couple of months have gone by and you know, the show's being edited and getting ready to come out. So now they're in a bit of a bind because they've got no book, they've got no author. They don't know what they're going to do. And he very kindly says, well, my friend Steve Jones will do it. Go and talk to Steve. So the BBC contacted me and they said, um, yeah, would you be interested? And I said, well, it all sounds a bit iffy. How long have I got? They said a month. I said, well, what? They said, you, you want me to do this in a month? They said, well, yeah, because your friend had like the three months we had planned for it to be done. Oh, now we've no. got to get it done and, half the and, time. and you know, set and printed and everything else. I went, what? And I said, all right, let me let me think about the easiest way to do this. Let me think about the easiest way to do this. And I thought, okay, A to Z of horror. And, I, and I, whatever my friend had done, I've never seen his version. So I don't know what how he came to it. He came to it in a different way. And I went back to him and said, do you have the tapes of this show yet? And he went, oh, yeah, yeah, we've got edited tapes. I said, well, just give me the tapes and I'll write the show. I mean, I'll write it as if, you know, each episode A to Z. And I'll take your A to Z. I'll take Clive's intros and quote his intros and all that kind of stuff. And basically do the show as a book. But the one thing I'll do is I have this genius idea, guys, which you've probably never seen before. I do little sidebars, little boxes of information, <laughs> lots of pictures, yeah. lots of things lists. like this. And he went, wow, that sounds amazing. That sounds absolutely amazing. I said, yeah, yeah, you know, it'd be great. We can run little snippets of interviews on the side and little reviews and little stuff like that. And I'm thinking, what, it worked last time for Shadows in Eden. It will work again yeah. for this. Um, and I said, look, and don't worry about the stills and the pictures. I've got all that in my collection. All the covers, all the photos, they're all from my collection. I'll just give you everything. I can give you copies. I can come into the BBC. You can let me, again, no computers at this point. You let me use your photocopier and I'll, I'll photocopy stuff off. For the stills, we can go through a photo library. I can tell you what to use. Um, all this kind of stuff, yeah. And you know, we do things like that lovely shot there of Roger Corman with the camera. We cut the text out and run it around the pictures. We make it as close as we can to a TV show in a book. OK. So. That was all going to go great. And I had the tapes and they were the VHS tapes again. And I had to I had to watch them and I had to sit there with the typewriter. And, and literally write the chapter as I'm watching and like fast forward through that bit. Oh, that's a great bit. I'll take that. Or, oh, wait a minute. They, have, I've got better reference stuff. I've got a reference book over here. Or I've got these novels. Or mm. I've got this other stuff. So I, I started to add more stuff to the book, to the show, because they weren't really, yeah, they weren't really putting stuff in there. Um. So basically, I, I extrapolated. I, I, I built up what they already had. But. I had to go to a convention, and again, it was it was a world science fiction convention. It was in Scotland, and I had this de insane deadline. And so, at the convention every day, and it was a week long convention, I would say to everybody after lunch, I'd say, "Right, sorry guys, I'll see you at dinner." And I would go up to my hotel room and write another chapter of the book in my hotel room. It was the only way I could do it: watch yeah. the tape, write the chapter, end up with that come down see you guys for dinner i did that every day at the convention i went up and wrote another chapter another chapter anyway, multitasking multitasking because wow. there was no time sure. and then i delivered my book i delivered the book to them i said um here's the book here's all the bits all the pictures all the cutouts all the sidebars and they went great fabulous fabulous, fabulous. We'll pay and they actually paid me what they paid my friend not to write the book i got paid they paid me he got paid exactly what i got paid to write the book he got a kill <laughs> fee which was exactly the same amount of money wow. and I've got to tell you, 
to date, to date, it's the most amount of money I've ever received for a book. Most wow. amount of money I've ever been paid for a book. It's very successful. Uh, although I don't get any royalties, of course, because it's a BBC book. It's, it's considered a tie-in. So I don't get any royalties. It was just a, oh. it was a flat fee. Anyway, it goes to the BBC design, to BBC Books Design Department. Right, Hammond, Hammond. And they come back with the book and it looks like shit. It oh. is horrible. It is absolutely horrible. It's like they had no idea what they were doing. They had no idea where to put the pictures. They had no idea to put the sidebars in. It is a mess. It's like a dog's dinner of a book. And I look at it, I said, you can't put this out. This is terrible. This is just awful, guys. And the BBC, and again, God bless the BBC editors. They said, what would you do, Steve? I said, can you give me a week? And they said, yeah, why? I said, all right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to photocopy on your photocopying machine, your Xerox machine. I'm going to photocopy the entire book as it looks now. I'm then going to cut it up into little bits of paper and stick them down on a piece of paper. And then your design department is going to follow that layout. Like this layout right here. That mm -hmm. layout there, you know, overlapping, overlapping yeah. pictures, underlapping pictures, doing all that stuff. So... I did that. I, I did two copies. I did two photocopies because you sometimes, you know, you lose stuff because you're cutting around it and whatever. Cutting around like zombies and yeah. Boris Karloff and stuff yeah. like that. And I literally sat down with a pair of scissors and, and a, a couple of tubes, several tubes of glue and some white paper. And I made it a collage. I made the whole book like a collage. And I laid it out for them. And I said, OK. Get your guys to follow this. It will work. And they did. They actually the, they turned it around in a couple of weeks in the in their art department. They made it look fantastic. They made it look great. All right. Phew. Finally, this little book it was hell. This little book from hell was <laughs> done. You would think. You would think. As I mentioned, they went to HarperCollins, right? Now, HarperCollins thought, oh, Clive Barker, we'll make some money out of this. We'll do a hardcover version before we do the paperback. In, in England, it was only ever done as a BBC paperback. All right. And I knew yeah. I knew the editor at HarperCollins. She's a great editor, a great friend of mine, was Clive's editor, um, was Terry Pratchett's editor, is Neil Gaiman's editor. I mean, you know, she she knows her stuff. She's very, very good. So she you've got the hardcover there, haven't you? Okay. I do. I do. Yes. Have this you ever looked at it closely? Have you ever looked at it closely? I know that uh, there are different colored letters for the different editions, correct? No, that's that's fine. That's the cover. That's fine. They did a nice job of embossing it and and they putting did, it on yeah. shiny paper and everything else. But have you ever looked at the layout properly? Um, You'll have what... to go through it page by page, but I'll tell you now. You probably won't be able to find it. Okay. I get a copy of the hardcover from them. I get, okay. you know, a, box of, I get a box of hardcovers from them thinking, wow, this looks good. This looks a really nice looking book. I'm proud of this. Wait a minute. What are these lines around pictures? What are what are the, what are these like smudgy bits? What is all this? Oh, they had, they had printed from my cutout version, <laughs> not oh. for the finished art. I am seeing the smudges. Oh my god! On page can 15. you see them? You can yeah. see like faint lines around things, and and they're my oh scissor. My they're my scissor cutouts. Like yeah, this. I, I see one right here. You can't see it on every page. Yeah, on page 15. It. They basically printed the hardcover from my rough version. Like It's insane. This particular thing, a little bit of it up. There's a little smudginess up here. Yeah, you'll Just get below that. the text. Yeah, Because they printed it off of what was basically the rough <laughs> test version that I'd I given see. them as a guide. Because they wanted to do the hardcover, and because they obviously had a, a longer, they had, they had a shorter lead time, somebody at the BBC went, oh, look, we've got this already. We'll just send it off to them. So they hey, sent them off. What, the about, what about this line that goes down the page? Is that intentional? Well, that's probably just, you know, it's probably where they got the edge of the page on the British-sized oh, paper. Amazing. I've never noticed that oh, in all these wow. years. No. So when Even they around photos. To... Sorry? Even around some photos. Yeah, of course. 
because you know they they're working off a basically a, a cut and paste version of the gotcha. book. Wow. When they came to do the paperback afterwards, they used the same version as the BBC used for their version. I had no mm -hmm. idea there was uh, a difference. Which huh. is which is perfect. But well, as I say, I'm about to tell all you Hellraiser fans and Clive Barker fans, if you want the variant, the rare variant, you need to pick up the hardcover. Because that was a mistake. The whole book is a mistake. Oh. I've got this one beautiful. with gray letters. I know there's one with red letters. And I know Yeah, the paperback. I think the paperback has red letters. That's why. Right. Yeah. The yeah. paperback has red letters. But um and it's not embossed, whereas that's embossed in silver foil. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, so even up to the end, it was still being a disaster, that movie, that book. It was just a nightmare to work on. Um the paperback I'm very proud of. And I, as I say, I, I took what they had for the TV show. But then there's one more wrinkle to come. One more wrinkle. I've written the book based on the episodes of the show they gave me, right? So I had the whole yeah. show. I've sat down. I've gone through the tapes. I've extrapolated where I needed to. I've talked to, I did interviews with people who aren't in the show, but I, I knew them. So I interviewed them about, especially the Dennis Wheatley section. Um, I knew the guy who was Dennis Wheatley's assistant back in the day. Mm -hmm. And so I interviewed him and got a lot of really information about Dennis Wheatley in there. Um, so, you know, that, that was really a much bigger version than there is in the TV show. Anyway, the book is done. He's gone to press, and the BBC decide to re-edit the show and cut two episodes out. Yeah, and I noticed some of the letters are a little di different, are, are different from the some of the letters in the a couple of them in the book. Right, right. It, it, it yeah, looks like uh, right. yeah. they, they took, they took what they had yeah. and they mixed it all up. Yeah, and so here was I following the A to Z of horror, the A to Z to horror. And they just messed it all up. They cut some stuff out. They moved some stuff around. Yeah. And I believe it ended up as two whole episodes shorter than the version I saw. Right, right. I was looking at that. Uh, and you know, guys, I might actually have those up in the attic with everything else. Oh, I think wow. I, kept, I think I might have kept those original tapes up there. Oh, Whoa. my goodness. Yeah, it so never you might came eat... out as a release. Uh, so the only things around, I think, are bootlegs, um, bootleg sets that people buy at conventions. Oh, did it, um, did it not play TV in America in the end? Because I know it played no. TV here once and then they repeated it late at night. And I think, again, it was dip, again it was a slightly different order or something when they repeated it. I, I actually saw it on, I, I saw somebody on television here, but they basically threw it away at like 11 yeah. p.m. at night. They, I, they I only it. was able to see it on, a, on a, a bootleg that I bought at a convention. Right. Okay. Interesting. I know it's. I think you can get it on on YouTube. I think if you go on YouTube, yes, it, that might yeah, be. I think, and, and it's and it's really uh, staticky, like some. <laughs> it's a VHS like, recording. Oh, it's that someone's so it's like very dupey. It's like a copy of yeah, a copy of a copy. A yeah, yeah. Well, or like they pointed a camera at the TV screen. Could be. That's what people yeah. used to do back then. Yeah. Hmm. I might Did... next time I'm looking at the VHSs, I might go and have a look and see if I can see if I can find it. Oh yeah. Story. Um. There's uh, this article from Phil and Sarah on Revelations, Clyde Barker's official website, that talks about that, that the German uh, broadcast had more two more episodes. One of them was supposed to be vice versa, where Clive would discuss his career. Um, and apparently it's those missing episodes have never been found anywhere. So I, that, that explains a lot why the show seems a little... Um, disjointed is the word you're looking yeah. for. Mi mixed up. Yeah. It's a mixed up mass, a little bit. Well, and, the book and is a lot is. more focused. And again, it's 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 that age old thing. Like you know, TV shows do it all the time. Uh, publishers do it all the time. Yeah. They decide they decided not to bring in anybody who actually knew anything about the genre. They decided yeah. it on their own. I mean, I did another show with Clive for the BBC, uh, which was called Horror Cafe, which I'm sure you guys know yeah, about yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I was I was actually the consultant on that show, so they paid me to be the consultant. Um, and I knew Pete Atkins, I knew Ramsey Campbell, I knew I met Roger Corman on that. Um, I knew Lisa Tuttle, who we brought in for it. Um, and so I was uh, I was I was paid quite again quite handsomely by the BBC to be their their horror consultant on it. And again, what's that, 1991 or something? It's about that same time, again the early 90s. Um, and that was kind of cool because I went in for several meetings. I suggested who they should bring in for it. 
And it was funny enough, it was a format which I'd been developing back in the 80s for the TV company I was working at, for my own TV company then. And the idea was you, you, you've got a group of really interesting people to sit around a table and just talk about things, about their careers, about what's in the news, what's in politics, just to have a chat. But, you know, it would be, you know, it would be like, I don't know, um, you know, Arthur Conan Doyle talking to H.G. Wells, who's talking to, you know, somebody else. And, and, and you'd have these great people. Well, somebody came up with the idea of doing it for horror and, get you know, who are the who are the horror people we can get? And for some reason, I don't know how it happened. Roger Corman happened to be in London at the time. Um, Ramsey, they brought Ramsey down from Liverpool. Clive obviously was here. Pete was still living here at the time. Um, so my job was really just to come in, suggest people, um, talk about their careers, you know, do all that kind of stuff. And then I went to the taping. I went to, I went to the, I went to the, when they filmed the show, which was one evening at the BBC studios here in London. Um, and, um, I have to say it was the best green room I've ever been in. Oh, there sure. was so much yeah. food. There was so much food and, and unfortunately alcohol. Uh -huh. unfortunately <laughs> alcohol. And where they made their mistake was they let us all into the green room before they taped and then let us back into the green room after they taped. And oh, they actually dined and smoked. All the food. They actually checked, they threw all that food away or gave it to the crew. Yeah. And gave us a whole new and it was like it was like a Henry the Eighth buffet. I've never seen so much food for free in my <laughs> life. And I can tell you now, we spent another two hours after the taping just sitting drinking and eating. You know, oh wow! <laughs> although i've got to tell you i'm not going to name the, the, the name a great there was one participant who mr atkins and i had to carry to their taxi cab <laughs> oh <laughs> no they could not walk to get back to their <laughs> hotel wonderful they were so blasted with wine wow it's such but it high was a concept funny TV. Experience. again i don't know if that i, don't, I think that's available onto youtube as well isn't it i don't think that yeah, ever played it is. Pretty, uh, yeah. american tv I think I only played British TV once. Um, I've got the original cuttings from the Radio Times here for when it did play. I think it just played once here. Um, I think it was meant to be the idea of, you know, they'd have other writers, you know, detective writers or romance writers or other people. But it was a one off. It was the one thing they did. But again, the BBC paid me well for it. I didn't mind doing it. It's all. I like being part of this genre, the horror genre. And, you know, whether I'm doing press notes, that's writing, if I'm doing consultancy, if I'm doing commentaries on DVDs and Blu-rays, it's all part and parcel of the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it's all part and parcel of that thing when I was a kid mm -hmm. and read that book from Woolworths back in the in the 60s and thought I would never be able to do because I had no contacts. There's nobody I could go to. I had no ins in the, in the industry at all. And it shows a kid from a housing estate with nothing can work their way up through the system if you you know if you work hard and you keep working at it um you know you can work your way up and and you know it's by meeting that person you introduce you to that person and then you get to do a bit of this and that leads to something else you know i mean one of the one of the things i'm so happy about for trevor and phantasmagoria magazine you know he's been doing this for a few years now and he does it out of love mm -hmm. and he's just been nominated for a world fantasy award this year and it's his first award nomination for Fantasmagoria. well deserved yeah. Now, world fantasy is for me. I mean, I, I guess if if the World Science Fiction Award, the Hugo, is the Oscar, then the World Fantasy is the equivalent of the Nebula Award. Yeah, you know, it's the second most important award, and certainly in horror and fantasy, it's the biggest award. And you know, whether he wins it, whether he doesn't, and I've been nominated a lot of times and only won a few times, but just to get the nomination, I'm very proud for him because you know he's, a, he's a guy who, like me. And like you guys and, and what you do here, you love you love what you do. And you, yeah. you know, and I, I've got I've got a little a little sign above my desk here, and it says, uh, "Do what you love, and love what you do." And that's what I've done all my life on all these on all these projects, whether it's I, TV, whether it's movies, whether it's discs, whatever. It's, it's that's everything. amazing. I love that. That that is great. Um, yeah, we so, do this because we have to, right? Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've barely scratched the surface. So, yeah, I'll come yeah. back at some point when you're ready. Oh, yes, we'll please. Do a second one. Um, and and, we, and where can people... we can get on to Nightbreed. We can get on to Hellraiser 3. Yeah. Sure. And all that stuff. 
and That's where wonderful. can people buy videotapes from hell in a month when it comes uh, out? I'm hoping their local Barnes and Noble will have it. They've stopped the other books. If you can find a Barnes okay. and Noble anymore, um, obviously it'll be on Amazon. You can probably find it. Dis- all the other books are available. Okay. Of horror, horror movies, they're all on Amazon. They're normally discounted because um, nowadays they price books to be discounted on on Amazon. Yeah. Um, I believe if you live in Los Angeles, um, Dark Delicacies are going to do a signing for it next month. Oh, with, nice. With Pete Atkins, with um, Lisa Morton, with Dave Scow, David J. Scow, the other one. Mm-hmm. Um, and you everywhere else in the book they can get um, from the L.A. area. Hopefully Adam Simon and a few others. So, you know, wow. if you come from, from the L.A. area, check out Dark Delicacies um, website. I'm sure there'll be a date up there at some point and they're, they're doing a signing and you can always pre-order from them and get signed copies as well. Um, right, it's, so it's they're, they're, out... You pre-order signed copies, which is also a great way of doing it. It's yeah. coming out October 1st. Is that right? I believe so. Yeah. It was coming out at the end of September, but I saw on, on Amazon the other day, they're saying October the 1st. So okay. I'm, I'm guessing October the 1st. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, it should be out for Halloween. Let's face it. So I'm yeah. actually going to be. I'm going to be oh, over in perfect. the states. I'm over in the states for Halloween anyway. So I'm going to. I'm going to at least check and make sure it does come out for Halloween. Well, that'll be great. So it's going to come out from Roman and Littlefield. It's going to be videotapes from hell, a visual history of cult, collectible, and crazy video covers. And it's edited, of course, by you. And contributions by Peter Atkins, Barry Forshaw, Professor David McGill. McGillivray, Professor Sir Christopher Frailing, author of Vampires and Nightmare, The Birth of Horror, and co-curator of the Tate Britain Exhibition, Gothic Nightmares, Fuseli to Blake, Lisa Morton, Adam Simon, Ramsey Campbell, Kim Newman, Luigi Cosi. I've seen yep. Cosilla recently. That's a weird movie. Graham Humphreys. Well, I go when I'm in Rome, I go to Luigi's shop over there, Fondo Rosso. He has oh. he has a he has a specialist horror store in Rome. Oh, so fabulous. if you're ever in Rome. Go and visit his store. It's full of um, books, magazines, toys, movie memorabilia. It's been there for years. And it's actually owned by mm-hmm. Dario Argento. Oh, my oh. gosh. He's the wow. other partner in the store. And I've, downstairs, I've... if you're very lucky, Luigi might show you the Dario Argento, Dario Argento Museum, which is downstairs oh. in the store. Whoa. Wonderful. I have uh, I've was lucky enough to see, I think, Suspiria and uh, Demons. Uh live screenings with Claudio Simonetti from Goblin playing the live music oh, to yeah, that. Yeah. And this yeah, week, I, yeah, last year, I, right now, yeah. I got to see, uh, last year, I got uh, the, mm. this week, I got to see Fabio Frizi doing the live score for Zombie um, from Lucio Fulci, which was pretty amazing here in Cleveland. That was gorgeous. But uh, keep an eye out for videotapes from hell. Mm-hmm. And it's a profusely illustrated book. It's going to be about 220 pages and a hardcover like we've seen. And I definitely want to talk to you again soon. I, I yeah. thank you so much for oh, your yeah. time. Well, we, haven't, we haven't even talked about these. No, I know. And I, I, I know. Know, had them all ready to go and everything. But and I'll show uh, you something else, guys, before you go. This is, this is a, a yeah. nice little thing. Have you guys ever seen this? Oh, is that the, is that the, the making of Nightbreed? No, oh, it's that's the. Of, it's German. Oh, oh no. Okay. And it's that... one of nine variant boxed versions, which I worked on with them last oh. year. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. yeah. They're called steel books. Yeah. Wow, that's really nice. So next time we can talk about that. Yeah. Sure. And, I would love to and get through that. Just to, just to finish this off, this is being reprinted as we speak. Apparently. Oh. I didn't know. So they didn't come to me. Trust me. Um, you heard it here first. I'm, and I'm talking to Arrow about a, how, uh, a Nightbreed. Uh, oh, my gosh. Release. A definitive set for that? Because I, I keep saying right now, uh, yeah. the last few times, that Phantasmagoria Here's and the Quartet of Torment are the definitive uh, yeah. book and, and movie. Uh, well, if Torment anybody of Torment, wants to get into that. The Hellraiser one, what's it called? Hellraiser, Hellraiser Chronicles? No, the, the, the Arrow thing. What's it called? Oh, the Quartet of Torment. Quartet of Torment, yeah. 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 Stupid title. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, it did very well. Um, as you know, they brought out a earlier this year, they brought out a, yeah. a non limited edition version the Scarlet as well. Box. Yeah. Yeah. And before that, there was a Scarlet Box. Box. And I wonder yeah. if two years from now we're going to get another one. But well, again, Arrow brought out a Nightbreed a year ago, or mm-hmm. two years ago, which I didn't work on because I refused to work on it because it wasn't very good. Sure. And now yeah. they're talking to me about doing 
something more like the quartet of torment so um, oh fingers yes. crossed maybe next time i talk to you i'll have more information um but before that as i say the germans got to me last year and we worked together on this uh, maybe next time i'll bring all nine versions to show you because it's oh my God. nine different boxes and they get and they send Amazing. them all to you it's lovely um, and that's got a documentary on in english which is fantastic about nightbreed oh yeah seen, well, i've seen pictures of that some time ago but got a lot reason, of us on it i'm on it there's a lot of people they interviewed yeah. dog they interviewed all sorts of people i it. think the um, reason why i got blinded to that was because it's in german and I, I i visited german many times and i honestly did not buy any books or dvds in germany because they were all dubbed in german i think the documentary so. is actually in english with german subtitles for that's good yeah that's um, wonderful. and also they use some of my epk footage for the first oh. time oh i had no idea for nightbreed for nightbreed yeah oh, i finally wow. released some of the epk footage for the documentary on the german version and if we do the arrow versions and i want to do it we might finally cut all that together as a documentary oh, oh wow. that would be amazing all that material that i've got because i've still got it it's still sitting here because i know that that was not a, a pleasant experience for everybody involved uh because of how the movie you know was was the production was troubled we we were occupy midi and we got that started with russell when when that that uh yeah the, the the tapes were found the vhs tapes that had more footage of the movie mm -hmm. and so we actually got to do a commentary track once for a, a blu-ray that seraphin put out and there's another track there with russell charrington and his editor um but we'll have to talk about that the next time you're here because oh yeah because then i can tell you about the two hour rough cut i watched with clive at pinewood yes oh, please never yeah. been seen again which has never yeah. been seen again oh my gosh that sounds great. So I yeah. know you you said you had some time limitations. So again, I want to thank you for your patience and your time. I hope thank we... you guys for inviting me. Invite me back anytime you like, and we're 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 shooting the breeze some more about all this stuff. We're yeah, absolutely that, that intending to to have our audience know a little bit more about you, and uh, and hopefully they will get to know more about uh, all the work that you put in and all the stuff that you've assisted and all the authors that you've helped launch their careers. And uh, now we know a little bit more about the man behind the book. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Take care. I'll see you soon. Cheers. And one, one you. last thing, if you still have all that in your archives, I would love to see the commercial with the dancing bottle for the <laughs> fertilizer. That you, oh, you know about you that. Made. Right. Yeah. I, I do. don't have I don't have that anymore. The uh, okay. uh it was what yeah, was, the, the fertilizer for plants. Yeah. What was the product name? Do you remember? It was that? called it was the, the, I can tell you the commercial was called to put drop, drop, drop into the water water the plants and they would they would grow twice as high okay um, yeah i did a lot of strange commercials back in the day trust me <laughs> sure sure i can tell you about those i worked with david niven i worked with john cleese i worked with all sorts of people wow Bob baker all those guys i just saw a it commercial was... that barbie well did for a car insurance i believe yes and... yeah oh. it, or it, it was a like a, a psa about drunk driving i think oh that's right oh, well, yeah. back in the day yeah yeah, the day. yeah. it's called yeah. the jerk and i think it had a comedian in there but thank you very much for that again and i hope to talk to you again soon and uh it, it's been a pleasure i i uh, yeah. thank it's you been so a much. long time coming but uh finally we got it thank you good thank you see you soon take care bye 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 we had some feedback from our Discord from Eric, who is one of our Patreon backers. Uh, Eric says, this is regarding the Book Club of Blood. He says, great title, Book Club of Blood. I really like your idea of revisiting the book's stories in published or publishing order. Mm -hmm. uh, so much has happened since then. There are so many interesting things to discuss. For instance, the influence of Barker stories and books on other writers and artists or the different ways in which his stories have been retold, movies, comics, etc., and or continued by others. He said, but also, uh, what do his stories mean today? Are they timeless, or still relevant and topical, or do they need to do you need to read them sort of in context of the time period they were written in? So yeah, well, I think I agree. A lot to unpack there, right? Yeah. Um, but but I, I do agree. Yeah, I think that. There might be some small elements that are kind of more of a of 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 their time, but I think for the most part, I think they're pretty timeless. I agree. Um, I'm I'm sure I'll have a great time reading these stories again. Um, yeah, I think the idea of revisiting the books 
he says that so much has happened. That's right. I mean, some of these stories have had movies made from them that we haven't. Yeah. I mean, we discussed the movie and and probably made a commentary track for it. But yeah, now we can go back and revisit the story and see what were the parts that they used. Um, yeah. How was it adapted? How do they do that for book? Book of Blood had two different adaptations. For example. right, there's Book of Blood and Books of Blood, and there was that little animation that they did for that uh, Made Fire. Uh, yes, right, right, <laughs> which was uh, a, a cartoon adaptation. Right, of, it, it uh, might be hard to Blood. go back and try to find that again. I don't yeah, know. I don't, if, was it ever put on YouTube? I don't think so, but yeah. um, we'll have to see if that Made Fire app still works. I don't think it does. No, but but in regards to that, I mean. And there's been influence, I guess. The there's been stories from Clive that have influenced other people, um, or things that have influenced Clive in the books of blood. And there might be authors and connections that we now see in these stories that we might not yeah. have known about when we read them. So there's that opportunity to bring a little bit more of our personal experience uh, into these stories, uh, discuss them, and obviously, I mean, I always have a great time talking about this with you. <laughs> so. I, I'm yeah. always happy to revisit that. Also, what do his stories mean today? Yeah, I mean, there there's themes that uh, the Clive the approach in his stories. Uh, you know, a lot of themes are like in the hills, the cities. There's a lot of stuff there. That's pretty timeless. I mean, as far as like, the, yeah. yeah, what as far as the the metaphor of that whole thing, the cultural difference between America and Europe, <laughs> the the way mm -hmm. that Europe has more history than America does and, and that goes back centuries and that yeah. connects it more deeply to the to the places and the legends of the places and different peoples and stuff. Well and, course, and this this sort of tribalism and 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 um nationalism, right? I mean the yeah. idea of you're you're a part of a bigger thing and and bound you know boundaries are so artificial, right? As far as like boundaries right. between countries. But and, it's and so important to some people. Uh, the way that that uh different countries can basically i don't like being told uh don't like this person or don't like that yeah. country because such and such it's like well there's a lot to there's a lot that we can go over that i mean there's a lot yeah. of basically the story with in the hills of cities you have two cities that fight each other and then it all comes to grief i mean war is never there's never yeah. a winner there's no victory in that and uh but then again, there's other there's other things we can go in and uh, also learn new things about the stories. Yeah. I mean, there's things that we can approach topics. We prepare. I don't know how you prepare your your discussions, but sometimes I go in, I listen to certain kinds of music. I try to find other stories that might be similar to the themes of this story so I can see how other people might have approached things like that. Yeah. And uh, and that can factor in, uh, come up with new interpretations. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 there was nothing like um the books of blood stories. I mean, I you know, maybe maybe we'll be able to think of stuff that's come out since that's similar, but I you know, I don't know. But it's interesting also that Eric says what um do you still need to read them sort of in context of the time period they were written in? You can. I mean, definitely I think you would get yeah. more insight out of the stories if you yeah. if you um contextualize them more if you try to find out i go into certain things and i don't know that everybody does that but like sometimes i try to find out what was the author going through or what was going on in his yeah. life when he was writing a particularly striking novel like there's a lot to be said about clive for example writing magica at a time of transition when he was going from you know England to America and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, and that, that's a, that's a that's one that you, you know that I even picked up on back then. You know, back when when those stories right. were new, it's like he right. wrote stories set in America, but they would they would call like the the hood of a car, the bonnet. You know, there there were like little you know little things that just he didn't know. You know that when he was writing, he didn't know that you know that in America they don't call it that. For example, where uh, how spoilers bleed. Uh, still topical today, still still important yeah. about you know the, the evils of colonialism and and how someone who comes in barging into um, a place that they don't belong or they don't understand, yeah. how much harm can they do to that to, place? to exploit them? Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, I mean, right now there's probably 60, 70 fires burning in the Amazon as we speak right now. I mean, Brazil Ugh. is on fire right now this summer. It's crazy. A lot yeah. of that stuff is. 
created by cattle ranchers and stuff to clear land for pasture and, and yeah. herds. But the Amazon is the lung of the planet. So, well, and, you know, and one one thing that we're going to do different from what we did in the past is we would do an entire Books of Blood book at once. And this mm -hmm. time we're going to dedicate a whole episode to a, a story. Yeah. And so it, it'll be as long as it needs to be. Maybe it'll only be 45 minutes or whatever. But, you know, I think it's nice to not feel the, the pressure of doing the whole book. The whole book. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And we can sometimes if we're uh, if it's going to be a short story that we don't have much to say, we can probably attach that to a, a news episode. Yeah. Yeah. We'll yeah. see how how that goes. Yeah, definitely. So thanks, I mean, thanks, Eric, mm -hmm. for for that uh, comment. We really appreciate that, and and also we do plan on inviting Patreon backers on to these episodes, you know, one at a time to talk to about these with us, and that'll also be another. In in addition to us doing this twelve years later, it'll also be another fresh perspective on on these things. Yeah, absolutely. Another another mind to tell us what was their experience with that story and how yeah. it, how it affected them how you know how it might have given them a different perspective on life maybe that's a little too extreme but, but i don't think so i mean there's been like sometimes that, yeah yeah i mean i'm, I'm much more open-minded nowadays because i i started reading the right artists that yeah appeal to me feeling as an outsider mm -hmm. so yeah but uh thank you for that that question that was a really good question and uh, yeah. i hope that we answered it satisfyingly uh, satisfactorily yeah. Yeah. Well, and that, so, yeah, I think I'm, I'm looking forward to that and we'll start planning that soon. And speaking of that, uh, coming up next, we're going to, we've got a Jericho squad, uh, in the books, you know, ready to, we're going to be, uh, doing a new Jericho squad episode. Um, we'll be coming back to boom, Hellraiser, bestiary comics discussion. Um, the Hellraiser quartet of torment disc four, where hopefully we'll be able to have Pete Atkins come back. And then, of course, the Book Club of Blood will be our new uh, our new series that we're going to start up. Sounds great. A lot to unpack, a lot to do. I've recently found something for the Patreon backers. I've found, uh, do you remember a story with no title, a street with no name? That oh, yeah. A, that was a quick little, maybe half a page. Was that story. on America Online? And that was on a website called Kaleidospace. Oh, okay. In, 1994 1995 yeah and um they had these author spaces that they would feature and one of them was clive barker and for that he yeah. did something that was new at the time i guess i mean i was on the internet in 94 um the beginning the early years of the internet yeah. i guess you could call them the the mainstream when the internet yeah. was going mainstream and you you had it on every campus and stuff i, I had a web browser that was text-based it was it looked like a dos prompt oh you mean like a just a like a monitor like a console where you would log in and yeah yeah you just yep yeah. my, I remember my the, worldwide uh, web was only text I, I remember yeah. the computer lab in my uh, faculty was they still had these Hercules monitors with green text. Oh yeah, <laughs> and you would log in there, and you could check your email on a on a text only uh, browser thing. I think you had to do Telnet students, yeah. and then put the. So that that's kind of dating me. Um, yeah, I my my Netscape. I had an Amiga five hundred in college, and so it it couldn't hold up to like the World Wide Web and stuff. Sure. Yeah. So I had to dial in as if it was like a BBS, you know, and just see the only the text of the websites. Back in my archives, I was going through that to come up with more uh, Patreon stuff. And I found that I had printed out and kept a bookmark uh, in the Internet Archive of this website. The oh. story with no title, a story with no name, that people were opening that for other people on the Internet to submit their next part and yeah. then make a collaborative story yeah. uh, that Clyde Barker began. Yeah, so, like that Odyssey one. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm lucky I found this because I was I was looking around for it uh, a few weeks ago and I couldn't find any trace of it on the internet. And I'm lucky I found the this bookmark that I had saved from the internet archive because there was, without knowing what web page address yeah. to search for, you can't use the Wayback Archive. It, it requires that you put so it in the So it URL. only exists on the Wayback Machine. It's not actually in the 
Oh, yeah. It's not actually live anymore. No, that uh, Kaleidospace website disappeared a few years later. That's the thing about the internet, right? It's yeah. tenuous. It's it's an illusion. It's just files yeah. on some computer. When the computer goes down, there you yeah. go. He lost it. It's yeah. gone forever unless you print it or saved it. Or somebody just doesn't want to pay to host something anymore, right? Like if we stop right. doing this podcast and I said, you know what? I don't want to pay $20 a month to keep hosting this. Then all of our 462 episodes, 464 episodes will be gone. Right. And there, there'll just be some people out there with these like USB pens with our first hundred episodes or something like that. <laughs> yeah, but, right. Uh, which was a backer reward. Yeah. And, and I found all the other parts that were added, which were not a lot. I think there might be just five, six, seven parts that, that okay. different, different authors submitted. And I found it, I downloaded it, and I'm going to make a Patreon post about it. I might open this one up, you know, for the other uh, blog yeah. as well, but I'm working on that feature right now. You'll be able to read every part. And I just found out one pretty big author nowadays who actually also worked with Stephen Jones, uh, Steve Rasnick Tem. Yeah. He was already published at the time. He started his career in the 80s, but he did a part for this. He One of the parts that was submitted for the story was by Steve Rasnick Tem. And uh, I just recognized the, the name from looking at stuff, interviews with Stephen Jones, and I went back to it. And that triggered me to find that Wayback Machine link wow. and discover that story again. So I'm unearthing it from the uh, hidden depths of the internet to, wow. um, to come back. Even Phil and Sarah don't have a lot on their website about this story. Uh, they only have Clive's part, and they said, uh, sorry, we don't have a lot of information about this. If you do, please send it to us. So oh, okay. I'll, I'll do that, and I'll send it. Oh, great. Yeah, well, that would be awesome. So we, we got another Patreon post coming up, and I yeah. hope you guys enjoy it. And okay. this podcast, Having No Beginning, will have no end. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you have subscribed. You can find the Clive Barker podcast wherever you find audio. Show notes for this episode, as well as news and reviews, can be found at our website at www.clivebarkercast.com. The Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial podcast and blog that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. You can chat with us on our Facebook BarkerCast listeners group, our Facebook page, Twitter, or our Discord server. The best way to support us is to buy our book, The Barker Cast Interviews, Occupy Midian, available in hardcover on Amazon and ebook on Amazon and Apple Books. Fundraiser 10 is all about Patreon this year. Become a patron to get access to exclusive stuff, pick an episode topic, and maybe even get cool stuff in the mail. You can also buy a t shirt on our T Public store. Go to tpublic.com and search for Barker Cast. Leave a message for us using the SpeakPipe link on our blog. Opening and ending music generously provided by Ray Norrish. Thanks for listening.